murder happens, <laughs> and then you have the, the opening titles. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Now, now tell your story. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Now tell your story. <laughs> okay, so at this, this is Gen Con in uh, Wisconsin Parkside. And it's a seminar on how to do magic items. And as he said, and this is all I'm going to say to start is, there are two ways to make magic items. A cool idea, and then try and make the cool idea real and put game rules around it. Or in my adventure, right here and right now, I have this need to do this to any player character that walks into this room or reaches this point in the adventure or engages in this encounter. So I need a magic item that does X. So those are the two ways you can design a magic item from. And then, of course, because we have an ex-TSR designer on this call. Hello, Stephen Chen. <laughs> um, he will tell you Stephen that... Stephen Chen, everybody. There, yeah, there are not two ways to do a magic item. You, there are about 16. <laughs> You don't have to limit yourself <laughs> at, least, those at least. But formally, those were the two ways. <laughs> well, come up with a cool idea and try and shoehorn it into the game system without ruining the game, or stumble upon a game need and try and invent a magic item that meets it. And that is why there was never any internal consistency in Greyhawk. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, I, th I thought you were going to talk about there. the uh, bubble. <laughs> oh, the giant bubbles. Well, no, anybody can read those in the Greyhawk booklet. They're there. <laughs> oh, I thought we were talking about, you know, bubbles of Shadowdale, you know. No, like the uh, giant bubbles in Greyhawk where you kill it and it explodes and gives you magical items. Yeah, yeah. The the, the <laughs> bubbles, bubbles dances on the stage in Shadowdale every second on <laughs> <laughs> He's got the Sally Rand of Austin, right? You know? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. We're, we're I see we're off to a great start. start. We are. And we are recording this, too, for posterity. So. Oh, good. <laughs> and our Stary. YouTube channel. So, um... so if you look down at your posterior, that's where you'll be sitting on the recording. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Hey, I can recycle my father's own radio jokes. <laughs> Are you playing the video of us or just the podcast? No, of us? I'm doing both. I'm actually streaming a live yes. to Twitch. Okay. Right now, so. Um, All right. Uh -huh. So. Yes, we, we are listed say, as a not for children station, so don't worry. <laughs> anything will be taken down and used against you. That's right. That's really yeah. responsible of you. <laughs> That's the truth. That's right. That's right. So How anyway, bad. we're going to be creating magical items. So and we're going to be starting off using first edition. Okay, we thought we'd start off, you know, really not as old school as Ed said about you know stabbing bubbles that float around and yeah. making magical items drop into, out of the ether. Oh. But uh, we're going to be doing it from Broken first edition, and so we want to make sure that, uh, and maybe if we, I mean, if we can't go to the other editions, we will as uh, do that as well. But I think we're going to start off doing first edition, and I have the the, the DMG, the original DMG here, page one twenty nine, for Did magical you? item rolling uh, charts here. Wait, why one twenty nine? Um, that's what it says. That's not. That's not right. One to, I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just which right. saying, I'm on the rings page. Yeah. <laughs> what what rings. printing do you have? This Remember, is, every oh. time they printed it, they added and removed signatures. Oh, this is um, this is a just a PDF that I pulled off the internet. This oh is, oh well, oh, a PDF <laughs> off the internet. <laughs> Revised by Chris Perkins in 2011. I have the December. Oh, wow. <laughs> December 1979? I don't know. Mine, mine, <laughs> mine is in the closet. I couldn't find it, so I pulled this off the internet. Oh, uh, Jeff, you can come out of the closet anytime. Yeah, anytime. Now. I did that a while ago. Table. Hey, all right. Well, whatever was, page it is on your ancient book there, Stephen. So. As, as a precursor to today, I was thinking about magic item tables and how I miss them. I always thought they were great. And I remembered when, when FR, FR4 The Magister came out with the its own <laughs> its own little magic items tables for all of the items in there. And, and I went, uh-huh. And so then I spent all the time 
transferring those items into the unearthed arcana revamped magic items tables. Oh god. And, and <laughs> wow. giving them and giving them appropriate realms in names. So like Bokob's blessed book became Mistress Mystical Manual and things like that. Ah, uh, yeah. And um, that and does then after like something you do, George. And then after spending <laughs> at least a week doing that, I realized I wasn't playing a game and had no use for it. But anyway, <laughs> I don't guess. <laughs> You can't do it, George. We can put it in a book somewhere. A Life Well Lived by George mm, Crash. Well, that's yes. right. That's right. Okay, so uh, since Eric has to leave early, I think that we should let him, um, instead of just rolling on the magical item, pick, is there something you would like to have a magical item for? Is there a, a wand, a scroll, a mace, anything that you would want? I'm going to let you pick it. A wand of Westgate to regulars tickling. That's right. No, that's, there, no, no, that's the there hammer are of tunneling. Indeed, <laughs> several magic items that the Westgate regulars have recently come across oh. that could be interesting to build here. I was chatting with uh, one of my players the other day. He picked up a book. It wasn't this book. <laughs> oh yes, I have that one. I have that one too. <laughs> Uh, the book he picked up is called The Librum of Ineffable Damnation. Oh, boy. And it is specifically about uh, devils and the structure of the hells. And I described it as a mixture of uh, Machiavelli's The Prince and The Art of War and How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> and as written true. by uh, Asmodeus and other devil lords. <laughs> Wow. And picking it up turned him lawful evil, but it also has several other uh, characteristics that I haven't determined yet. So that could be really fun for us to uh, figure out. I mean, if the you want to, book has the book or what? I'm, I'm the book is basically an artifact. Yeah. Okay. Um. It okay. It turned him lawful evil. Yeah. It gave him an evil mark. Now his the pupils of his eyes look like. Gulls. So if you get Bingo. really close, if you get really close, widow's peak. Dude, you know that's just yeah. Give a widow's peak. That's no, right. he he's got the he's got the emo Spider Man three hair. Okay, <laughs> the widow's peak will really disturb him. Yeah. No, but 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 Eric has stumbled across right away the important thing about an artifact. There should be a visual tag mm -hmm. that applies to people who open it and use it. Exactly. Um, and it has enhanced his strength. So he has like these little black veins running through his muscles. Oh, nice. uh, his strength is now 22, which is pretty outstanding. <laughs> and, but it has dropped his charisma, which is now six. <laughs> hey, mate, so, my, my dwarf is a six. Charisma. I was going to say, that's Jeff's character. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. Oh, so you know oh. it. It he's, has actually, in a hood. <laughs> he's actually the bard. His strength is his strength, not his charisma. So, oh, okay. oh anyway, so the it's, bard it's lost charisma. Thing. That's not good. No, but he never really relied upon it. It's it's a, it's a whole thing. Anyway, I want to figure out what he's else. He's the, the bard. bard. So, yeah, it has to have, okay, if it's a bad artifact, it should have a side effect. Yeah. Like, I don't know, con uncontrollable farting. So maybe if, he's a bard, <laughs> maybe if he's a bard, he can now fart show tunes or something. <laughs> and therefore, okay, how, how many how minutes in for the first fart joke? How many minutes in? That is that is the thing that you not, might expect it devils to really, do. Really, it was actually six, eight minutes in for the first joke. <laughs> so, uh, well. He could actually accompany himself while singing. He could be a one-man band. <laughs> Okay, okay. Oh, so, uh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> flatulence and or wanted... brimstone smell. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. no, it's flatulence with a brimstone smell. Yeah, exactly. I said yeah. and or. No, and or. No, okay. no it has to be and. <laughs> okay, oh, okay. Boy, what if, be... to, to give him an effect that's more personal for him as a bard, depending on what he's singing, his range will shift. He, he'll sing songs about chaotic things in a falsetto, but he's a deep soprano for something else. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, I was thinking to... inspiring people to combat because he sings a beer. <laughs> <laughs> to, to delve into third edition, maybe if every once in a while when he's singing a tune, it doesn't have to be in combat or anything, all of a sudden it becomes dark speech and 
damages people as per the feet or something like that. That that or he has to play he learns it later, but he has to play something every single day. No matter what where they are, it mm. has to be played or something happens to him, which is a detriment. Mm. Interesting. Um, the dark speech thing that George brought up, that's a, um, a, the fifth edition Book of Vile Darkness gives you that ability as well. You can speak dark speech doing psychic damage to yourself, but more psychic damage to anyone who hears you. Mm. Right. Which is, it's really cool. interesting. So yeah, I, yeah. Something what's, like that. that can so make what's his musical instrument of choice or her instrument? I <laughs> wow. Oh, I think he's mostly just a singer. But okay. he occasionally plays the lute. He occasionally plays the drums. Just various instruments. Always poorly. Oh, so the instruments win. When he well, plays lute, the lute wins. Okay. <laughs> I, I just had this strange idea, like maybe the book has enough consciousness that it will make his lute strings break. And so he has to restring it from material from the book and the book will oh. kindly give it to him. So he suddenly got these black metal strings that really skew all of his music. <laughs> and that evil be, then. Yeah, that could be a neat scene. Like he he's doing his lute and one of the strings breaks, but he sees this black string poking out of the book and he's like, huh? And he's just pulling on it. It's coming out like hair out of the book. No, perfect. Think <laughs> about that. Air today, yeah. gone tomorrow. Oh, yeah. It's like the bindings of the book are now the bindings on his loot. The Book of Ebon bindings. Ooh, book of Ebon bindings. There you go. Okay. Okay. Mm, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Well, well, what else are you looking for this instrument or this book to do? Um, as, as, some, as the some DM advantageous. Area. Some advantageous property. Would be nice. Were though. you intending for him to get this item as a DM? You know, kind of. Not or okay, cool. So well, my campaign is mostly a sandbox. Like it does have rails, but they're very pretty deep under the sand. Right. So, so I would say over a long period of time, he should gain one ability point because this now up to the book, not up to him. Because the book wants him to stick around as a bearer until he can take it to the right, better, new bearer, ah. which is when the book will turn on him. Mm -hmm. But until then, the book wants to help him. So he might gain a point of ability score. Or the book might flare up at a moment when he's rolled a one at a bad time. And he gets to re-roll. Interesting. Because the book decides, oh, no, no, we, we can't have you going down quite yet. Not That's not right. here in the middle yeah. of the adventure. I need you to take me to fill in the blank first. The book of insidious right. luck. <laughs> I don't want these goblins to have me. That's yes. Right. Oh, I will wait right. until you're under attack by devils. That's right. Then yeah. I'll That's turn good. on you. That's a good Perhaps idea. an archlich. That would be more fitting for a book of my stature. <laughs> so basically a percent chance on a rolled one for the DM to make a secret alternative roll? Is that how that rule should read? Or should there be an actual another physical roll made? Sure, the, the DM player? really rolls. Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that way the DM still has control of the book for the time being. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, Because my... to a player, a one is a one, and they're going to expect the worst. But when the DM announces something completely advantageous, they're going to be stuck like, huh? What? But I rolled a one, and that's kind of the point. Well, in my games, I have this thing called the fumble chart, which is a list of things that, like, interesting things that happen when a PC rolls the one. Okay. Some of them are positive. Some of them are negative. Many of them are just kind of indirect. Right. Like, uh, the ground starts shaking and people lose their balance, or it starts raining, or um, you miss your enemy but uh, establish better footing and you get a defensive bonus, that kind of thing. So... It wouldn't be outside the realm of possibility for him to roll a one and something positive to happen, or at least something seemingly positive to happen. Right, right. Mm. I, I have a brief thought, though. Something 
don't mention it outright unless you're asked about it. But what if I don't know how fastidious that character is? Hmm. It's since somewhat he, it can, since he takes possession of the book, he never has to trim his hair or his fingernails, his skin. He, he never, you know, the book is absorbing any dead skin cells, hair, etc. It's Aww. reinforcing itself with. Yeah, there's there are like new pages every yes, so often. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> oh my god, and the new pages. Like, are how is this book made or, of human you know, skin? Maybe well, it's, it's not just a random effect. Skin. If you drop it in a dungeon, suddenly all the dust and cobwebs have been sucked away into the book. <laughs> if you think about it, if you look through it, the pages, each section is a different color of pages. Because it depends on the mage that had had it before. On that could be a great visual. The book on the floor of the dungeon and all these yeah. spiders, tiny ones, are frantically trying to get away. And, the, and they're, they're being dragged <laughs> backwards into the book, clawing yeah. the floor. Uh, and there's there's goes, one page where you think it's a spell, or maybe is that part of is that corner a tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking to trade on Ed's Ed's idea about it wanting to go to its better owner uh, oh, yeah. down the track. That maybe it's acting as a really long term mirror of uh, opposition. So once it reaches the point where it has no use for the character, it will spring forth with a a version of that character for him to fight. Um, hmm. And then the if the idea being that if the opponent kills him, then the book is free to move on. And if he then kills um, the the what the book creates, then he has a modicum of control over the artifact that he didn't have before. Interesting. Uh, hmm. But I do well, want to get worst thing could be if if this if whatever the book wants to go to, once it gets there, is it going to let go of this character, or it tries to or kill him? <laughs> would it kill him? Would it turn him into somebody like Gollum, who's no, only half to, a thing? He yeah. wants to absorb him, it, absorb him. He wants to create more pages with him, so he wouldn't yeah. want him to get away. Maybe or, it intends to deliver him as a sacrifice to its new master. Oh, there you go. Mm, there you go. Or <laughs> implant a thing in him so that sometime in the future, when the book needs a mission, a favor, mm. all of a sudden your character is compelled to undertake this highly dangerous task. Like, it doesn't walk know up why. through it. Yeah. <laughs> and do something for the book. Like something, a Russian sleeper agent. <laughs> something damn near suicidal. <laughs> Interesting. I love it. I love it. And I think we should add a little randomness to it also. So if you want sure. to, to roll on a table, do you want, you want something good or something bad? I think we've been talking about mostly bad things, so <laughs> let's let's go okay. with something positive. <laughs> All right, Curry, Curry, why don't you give me a roll and we'll see? And you don't you don't have to take the suggestion; we can do it again. But sure, roll, of course. Roll me a percentile dice, and we look on the magic items page here and see what. Um, and, and, and these are specific <clears throat> items, but you can maybe use the idea of what comes up to add to this book to give him some kind of how power. fitting we're baking a magic item <laughs> and now we're rolling to see what disaster occurs <laughs> when we bake something <laughs> what'd you get Isn't there one of the two ways to do it <laughs> the dice showed 36 36 well 36 on the chart <laughs> is growth or enlarged person mm. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry, is it that is, gross or a It is. Person? No, I'm, I'm, re I'm looking at it. <laughs> Steve, okay. look, at the, look at the chart. <laughs> I know exactly what I would do as a Dungeon Master. <laughs> One part of the person grows. <laughs> like the left hand, but not the right. Or the left slow, foot, but not the right. Slow, count. Oh, yeah, so you mean, so you mean more like an affliction like elephantitis? Well, no. Well, no, you could still use it. But they are visibly different in size. And if you're not used to it, um, you're going to lurch and stumble or, or fumble things. But on the other hand, you now have, you know, it's the old Mickey Mouse joke where suddenly your your left glove is twice the size of your right glove. So you can catch things or fill a doorway <laughs> right, or right. just stop something easily or lift or, somebody yeah. up like a platform. But if you're not used to it, you'll fall over. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you 
think, Eric? You want to roll okay. again, or you okay. want to keep that? Yeah, that's that's interesting. Okay. It like could be anything. It could be, it could be one eye. It could be his tongue. It could be an ear. Yeah. Or yeah. But one anything. thing: if the body has two of them, like ears or eyes, or what normally has two of them, um, then one of them is enlarged and the other is not. Right. Oh wow! And it, and it doesn't have to be a fifty percent larger left eye versus your right. No, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have, doesn't have to be a freakishly enlargement, but big enough to cause problems in the near future if with casting or playing a. He's a bard, so playing a musical instrument. So. Yeah, having having a, a left hand twice the size or a left thumb twice the length of the right one all of a sudden if you're strumming away on your lute that is going to that's right yeah cause problems that's right that's i just suddenly thought what if the top lip was yeah the top lip. Lip. yeah <laughs> that makes it hard to sing i was trying to avoid going there myself but yeah because immediately i thought of ian anderson and the flute and prancing around the exactly. stage I was there you go the upper lip falls down and he trips on it <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Ed has proclaimed your beneficial idea be damned. <laughs> That's right. Hey, I tried. No. What I'm doing. What I'm doing is handing the player a chance to be creative and inventive with something. My lady, will you take a quick trip on my upper lip? <laughs> Oh, I can I can, now, I can now carry all of the groceries. Instead of using right. an apron, I will just just put them in my upper lip and we'll carry them home. You know, it's all in how you use the thing, oh, wow. or not. <laughs> stiff upper lip, Bart. Yeah, yeah. Right. stiff upper lip. Oh. And the, the, the jokes are Thank endless. Thank you. I love it. The oh. jokes are endless. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know how there's this persistent narrative in the gaming community about how no one should ever be able to cast the spell Wish without it being twisted in, in some right, way? Right. Ed started that rumor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I did not. No, 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 I know. Shahrazad started that. Okay. <laughs> anyway. In fact, I was notorious at Gen Cons when we had a TSR bod DMing the table. But I would spout out, a, they only gave us limited wishes right. in those days, in all the adventures. But mm -hmm. I, I would fire out a wish, and I would word it like a lawyer, and their jaw would drop, because they'd be all ready to screw us with the wish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they'd stop dead, jaw would drop open, they'd stare at me and said, <laughs> bastard. <laughs> and, I, and I'd say, you mean good player. As a DM, though, uh, it didn't you one time with a company of crazed venturers that were yes. on the mountain and they wished to be inside the bar of the whatever the it was. The tripping dagger. Yeah. <laughs> and you said inside the bar? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And they arrived inside the bar shattering it with their bodies. <laughs> <laughs> and all the blast puppies they've been trying to get away from came with them oh, wow. and destroyed the, the common room of the Inn of the Dripping Dagger, blew it out into the street, and what was left of their bodies, they were lying there with still alive, but most of the mangled from the waist down. And the watch patrol came by and said, I hope you're very, very wealthy, gentlemen, because <laughs> replacing all of that and setting it to rights... It's going to cost you. And then they just yeah. grab them by the shoulders and they drag them literally <laughs> off to the castle water deep. Ooh. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, oh, unauthorized casting of magic within the city limits. Oh. Uh, are any of you a watchful order member? Hmm? Did you bring your credentials? Don't think so. <laughs> it, it went uphill from there. <laughs> so there was this there was a scene in the Westgate Irregulars campaign where they're they're confronting the big bad guy, right? One of the big, most powerful villain antagonists in the game. And he's there to talk. He's not there to fight. And they're like, yeah, but what if we attack him? I'm like, I guess you can do that. <laughs> and so Stong, the bard, the same bard who opened the evil book, like, as soon as the guy shows up, this is Lilton from my Shadowbane novels, if people right. have read any of them. He's like, all right, I roll initiative. I'm like, 
<laughs> okay. Listen, rolls initiative. He gets higher than them. Okay, he readies an action. What do you do? He's like, I charge him. Okay, as you're charging him, this is what I say. Wilson looks at you and he says, I wish you wouldn't. And then poof, you stong disappears. And everyone's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they was... didn't actually follow up on this like what happened to him but Wilson would have been like you know I don't really know and I don't really care <laughs> 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 so that's the kind of villain he is whenever the DM warns the player are you sure you want to do that that's when they should yeah. go no nah, I don't want to exactly I have a, a flask which says are you sure <laughs> And then in little text, it says your character dies at the bottom. <laughs> and every time my players do something crazy, I'm like. <laughs> and if they do it, I just, eh, all right, go for it. That, that line is, in our game that we play Saturday nights, that line is said at least once by Eric Boyd. Yeah, every and minute. Every minute. Yeah, yeah that's really, it's really. It's usually against Tom, Tom Costa. And, Isn't uh, Eric one yeah. of your fellow players? <laughs> no, no, he's at DM. He, he's the oh, DM. I thought. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. No, Tom Costa. No, Tom, I was going to say, if, if Eric is playing player. in that game, like he's doing a good job as a player. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to tell everyone else, hold up there. <laughs> Luckily, Eric doesn't have as good a job at, at keeping a straight face, or he could try to pull off, you know, Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka. No, don't stop. stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. Steve, yeah, Stephen missed. You missed. No, you missed two two ago. I think it was. But but yeah, he used it. Thwack, one of our dwarves usually says, "I'm going to do this," and then he just goes, "Are you sure?" <laughs> and like, of course, I'm sure. <laughs> and usually, and we end up fighting for the next three hours. So that's, yes. that's usually what yeah. happens. So, so uh, are we going to talk about another magic item? Sure, no, absolutely. Oh. It's going to help Jeff put his own show back on track. No. You know, Eric, Eric, you've known me long enough, and you know how our things go here. This is on track. So, you're in the dungeon. <laughs> you're in the dungeon. So you're, you're in the lobby. Yeah, let's go back and talk about that game. <laughs> Yeah, you're in the dungeon, and then four hours later, you're in the dungeon. <laughs> yes. Many, many years ago, I ran a game that Jeff was in, uh, and this game involved eating and drinking, uh, mostly drinking, gotcha. while playing. <laughs> and I tried um, I tried to start them off. I'm like, okay, so you're in the dungeon, <laughs> trying to set the scene. And then we would get on some other tangent, and then we'd be, you know, babbling for 10 minutes and i'm like okay so you're in the dungeon i did this 36 <laughs> times i counted <laughs> we never got any farther than the stairs into the dungeon and the cool part is by, is by the end of the bottle of scotch it was okay you're in the goddamn dungeon <laughs> still didn't work still didn't work no but nope. a good time was had by You him. can just see the drunk oh, yeah. he's out, you know, they're surrounded by goblins or whatever with, you know, knives, brandish. And the, Do you mind? <laughs> Do you mind? We've been standing here for three hours. <laughs> hey, it is so a you're quintessential. Telling me, oh. <laughs> you're telling it me it's a quintessential the quintessential D D experience. <laughs> what was that? What was that, Ed? You're telling me it's the equivalent of the American dream. Oh, pretty much. <laughs> so we're standing in the dungeon. So <laughs> we're right. standing in the dungeon when you're 80 years old and they're wheeling you into the nursing home. So we're standing in the dungeon. At least last, at least two years, not this year, but the last year's one when we actually did something. That's no, true. we, we, we were in the lobby the whole time. That's true. We, we weren't in the dungeon, but we weren't in the we, dungeon. We did it in we, the lobby? We got as far we'll as moving from, a room. from the <laughs> elevator to the lobby. That's as far as we went. Hey, I got That's Rick it. and Morty. I got Rick from Rick and Morty as my... <laughs> nice. So, we're going to do another magic item? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, we were talking about this potion earlier. Okay. It's a potion of fire breathing, but oh. not the kind or the direction you were expecting. <laughs> oh, okay. uh -oh. That's right. You missed that, George. That's right. Oh, dang. 
And you don't you don't help them until they until they drink it and they're like, okay. No, you you really don't. You're like, this is a potion of fire blasting. That's and right. They're like, oh wow, that sounds really useful. Yeah. Until, until you're the until you're the, the guy at the front of the party order and you take out your entire party. No, that's what you do. So everybody get behind me. I'm gonna drink this vial. <laughs> Boom. So the DM's just like, okay, so what's your marching order again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well there you go. It's it's pre- it's pretty much done. It's it's just shows over, guys. That was it. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, that is a dwarven made potion. That's right. It's, right. it's a potion of fire blasting, or if you're feeling a little bit. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> less, less uh, upset stomach. Or... Less right. polite about it. It's a potion of butt blasting. That's right. Uh, uh, it's uh, clearing no, the tomb. Oh, it's called on it's the po- upside. Po- if you were in under mountain and at the bottom of the yawning portal, it will get you right up to the the tap room. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, there does need to be a note when properly aimed will give you a fly speed of ten feet. That's right, 10 feet per second. Of course, you'll arrive with nothing on from the waist down. <laughs> Look, how is that any different from any other night at the... Uh, True. The yawning True. portal, that's yeah. right. The yawning portal, yeah. yeah. So you're telling me this potion is the equivalent of a teenager learning to drive in rural Canada. You're safe in the middle of the road. It's trying to hide in backyards and in woodlots and stuff where you're in. More Excuse me, I have to go right off driving instructor in Canada off my job list. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. So you're, you're in the dungeon. Item. Magic item. Yeah. More magic item. <laughs> magic item. Uh, yeah. Okay. And George, start us with one. Yeah, George. Yeah, give us give us one. Oh, okay. Um, I'm I'm a sword junkie. I love swords. So, and ju- I've still got the first edition DMG up. And that's what nice. I. Yep. So do I. And and Me too. what I what I loved about those swords were that there, some of them were really specific, like the old sword plus one plus three versus regenerating creatures. Mm-hmm. And you don't see that sort of stuff anymore. Um, you know, you just got this sword and you were just waiting for that troll to turn up. That's well, um, too complicated but, these days. No, it's <laughs> People are like, yeah. wait, what? What is my math? <laughs> yeah. But, but it's, yeah. it's the quirky part of that that I've always liked. So, you know, it's great to have a plus one sword or a plus two sword, but it's got to have something a little bit extra to it, just a little yeah. bit different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. Curry, roll the dice. <laughs> Curry, that's which, right. Which, which die would you like, sir? Uh, roll a percentile. And percentile we'll, again? All right. And we'll, we'll go Oh, to do we the, need my, my chart of random baddies? Well, we Ooh, have we good. have the ones up from the first edition. Well, you can use any chart you want. All right, twenty-three. Pick, George. A, pick up one of those DMG uh, first edition charts. Okay. Chart of random baddies. Oh, for random. You're random. telling me there's not a chart of random baddies well, in the first edition it, DMG? They'll call it random no. baddies. Of course yeah, they, they did. Demons. demons. Yeah. <laughs> Evil. <laughs> Evil. All right, random I encounters. Think they, I think yep. they called them side effects. Side effects. That's <laughs> right. Okay. Here. You know, like when the, the, the medicine's on the screen and it says side effects may include <laughs> incontrollable flatulence and death. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> I like it when they list the side effects, including the uh, condition that the medicine is supposed to I treat. I know, I know. <laughs> it may yeah. cause depression, but I am depressed. That's, that's why I'm taking it. It's such an American thing. You don't see that in Australian commercials. Yeah, I know, because it's legal here. In, an Australia, <laughs> in Australia, it just goes, take this, don't be a cunt. <laughs> this, you're going to die anyway, so who cares? Jeff, your podcast is still made in America. Watch your language. That's right, I need to be careful. <sighs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not so much of that you're going to be okay stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, oh, mm-hmm. oh. Okay, so George, he rolled a what? Twenty three, Curry. Twenty three. Yeah. Twenty three. Okay, I'll pick a table at random. Sweet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll go with Third plus one plus. That's three how I run one. my life. <laughs> right. I, I, I've, I've actually picked the miscellaneous magic table for number one. Number one. Okay. And that twenty three is a bag of holding. So, how would you meld a sword, magic sword, with a bag of holding? Whatever it hits, um, it sucks it inside. How's that? Yeah. The sword of you, holding. Yeah. If you sever any body part, you know, an ear, a finger, a thumb, into a nose. Sword. That's right. A, a, 
a, a, a man looks funny without a nose. It goes into the bag of holding. Or into the sword of holding, into the, the sword astral holding. plane. Yeah. yeah. And right. then you the can, sword you itself can... is an extra dimensional space. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. that night, when you touch the sword to a flame, you can will it. It doesn't have to automatically do this, but you can will it to spit out all the body parts it heads <laughs> into the cauldron and fry them in the fire yeah, and dinner. have dinner. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I'm having, like, I'm having like very old school Mortal Kombat flashbacks. You know, like the fatalities when you'd hit somebody and like yeah. multiple body parts would come out of them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can make that I, I, happen. I like the idea item. that if you, if you hit on a, on a critical hit, to use a, uh, something that wasn't in existence in first edition, um, the, 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 the weapon that you are fighting against, in other words, if they're fighting with a sword or a mace or whatever, gets absorbed by your weapon. So all of a sudden, they don't have a weapon. <laughs> no, but it could be anything. It doesn't have to be a body part. It could be another yeah. weapon. Yeah. yeah. Right. Shit. You better hope the other weapon doesn't have an extra dimensional space also. But you can and only... You, you, can oh, only, you, you better have like a sort of unattended thing. Oh, okay. I was so going to say why, otherwise. That's why if you yeah. chop off someone's ear, it's no longer attended, so the sword can just absorb it, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think but, but, I think it'd be a good way to disarm an opponent. And yes, exactly. Weapon. Exactly. On a disarm, hit, you can disarm yeah. an opponent yeah. by yeah. absorbing yeah. Your weapon. opponent punches you, and he's got no arm. He kicks yeah, you, brilliant. and he's got no leg. Oh, my God. Now, no, Okay, now we're getting into the slightly more powerful and slightly rarer armor of holding. That's right. There you go. There you go. Cod piece of holding. <laughs> that's a very. That's just an uncommon magic item. Yeah. Or as we like to call it, the azun. The azun. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I like that. Idea. This absorb the sword. The sword. Yeah. What? Gabber that comes with it takes on all the weight of whatever you've just absorbed. <laughs> oh. Mm hmm. Oh, that's the way you see. We, we're always thinking about bad things. It's got to be good things. <laughs> People play the game to get good stuff. You have to balance things out somehow. <laughs> as, yes, as, game balance. Oh, boy. As, have we got a 10 podcast series for you? <laughs> game balance. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> going, going on Stephen's idea, I think it would be cool for the sword's appearance to change slightly depending on what it's absorbed. So like the like the <laughs> handle and hilt look like a big mess, a big cobble of everything that it's absorbed. Tables, chairs, mugs, <laughs> ears, noses, hands, other no, sorts. The blade, the blade, the, Eric. And it, and it, so and you're it, it trying to hit onto somebody the blade with the ear. too. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, oh wait, no, there's a problem because if it does that. And you've managed to hit a ladder recently. You can escape a pit, you know. <laughs> exactly. Well, Curry, why don't you roll again and let's look for something <laughs> good to happen. <laughs> That's this idea. <laughs> but, but no, wait. And George, oh, still wait, has wait, to... wait, wait. And we have to go back to first edition. Yep. And we have to go back to TSR. <clears throat> so at this point, I have to say that won't work, and I'll tell you why. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Oh boy. Okay, you want another percentile, yeah? I got that right to my face. Yeah. Three times. <laughs> All together now, I got that reference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How could you miss it? <clears throat> okay, so so George, you get to you get to guess pick the the table. So this is on you again. Oh, I get to pick the table again? Yeah, yeah pick a pick a nice side table. Or a rosewood upright or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, a spittoon. I, I, I think miscellaneous magic is the good stuff. So yeah, we'll... Good. we'll um, oh, oh, there's the artifact table. What do you know? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not opposed to drawing up an artifact. That would be fun. Oh, Game okay, we'll balance! Go, we'll go miscellaneous magic table three in the first edition DMG. Let's see what, what we get. Well, I rolled a 50. 50. Or the mm. Horn of the Tritons. I see. There we go. Oh, nice. This would be a marvelous campaign killer. Because then the Dungeon Master has to stop play, send everyone for chips, chip dip, and pop, while he <laughs> creates while he creates the culture of Tritons from the word go. 
populates the campaign world with him because guess what? I'm still getting Twitter questions on for very good reason that the game has skimped on them all its time. Tritons. Really? <laughs> yep. there, are, there are two monsters from the original, Tritons and Titans, that are just sort of, we run by them. We mention them. And then we run by them, and we don't uh, do anything Steve, with them. Too Steve many teas. Too many. So, what are you talking yeah. about? Who in the Sea of Fallen Stars? Well, yes, you did them. Uh-huh. But obviously, else you did, did them, Steve. <laughs> because you're I'm not you were the staff for the Elf's Water. Come on. <laughs> no, what, what, what Ed's saying is you did them badly, Stephen. So no. I mean, oh, so oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh roll initiative, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Pull out your sword, quick, George. <laughs> You're yep. sort of yep. absorbing. So yeah, absorbing. pull out that sword so my tongue can grow. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> hey, uh, Steve, why don't you email me some stuff about Tritons and I'll put some in my campaign because it's in Westgate. So. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll, but the, the dragon mirror is brackish. It doesn't it doesn't allow, allow Tritons. I don't think. It's it's got hot That's, that's, that's true. Okay. Wait a, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did you brackish. just make it? Did you just make an ecological argument for why I can't have tritons in my camp? He did. He did. Much. <laughs> it, it, it's much. brackish from the neck. Damn it, George. <laughs> from the neck down. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to remember where Westgate's harbor mouth is. Ah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. The neck is. Yeah, it's, it might might be enough to have some tritons in the harbor. Yeah. Wrong book. Sorry. <laughs> C-W-S. Ah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Just bear with me. Let's see if I can find a map. Oh, my goodness. Quick, Agnes, check the map. It kind of depends on which map you refer to, which is not the best thing to say about the uh, <laughs> about a setting. I think of uh, actually, Westgate Westgate's, as, Westgate's outside the Dragon Mirror. Yeah, yes. I think of it as That's being on the Sea of Fallen Stars, not the Dragon Mirror. Yeah. So it awesome. is technically in the Dragon Coast. Yeah, oh, but no, no, no. no it's the, only brackish yeah. from the neck west, so you're okay. The neck west. Okay. So you can't have tritons. Now the question is: Would tritons want anything to do with a harbor that's had human shit dumped into it for about a thousand years? <laughs> well, we're going to wait a bit longer before we got into the fetishes. But hey, let's go. I yeah. think this is France. <laughs> okay. Okay. So <laughs> there's a discussion about triton <clears throat> alcohols and how they're made. <laughs> nice. Tide Town, which was a fourth edition innovation, basically drowned when the sea filled back up. So there's this whole section of the harbor that is like wrecked remains of buildings and such. Um, I could imagine some Tritons, particularly Tritons who want to uh, see what human civilization is like, investigating those. Uh, broken down buildings and recovering artifacts and things. That's and possible. L- leaving in a hurry after three hours. Holy crap. Did we have a narrow escape? <laughs> <laughs> well, the Quelzarn is still around. So although many people in Westgate consider this Quelzarn to be a myth. So. Okay. That, that is one of the oddest references that you ever came up with, Stephen. And I'm still to this day, never quite understood it. What's that? In your in your common theory book, you have this situation where you have one of the elves go off to the wizard's coast or something and get killed by a quail's arm, and it's a totally random entry, and I've never understood it. Like a like a quail's arm in the wild. Yeah, it's like he was hunting quail's arm in the middle. This elf left common not, theory, went hunting quail's arm and died. Not the quail's arm, but a quail's arm. Well, <laughs> it's, it's made to seem like a quail's arm. Stephen, <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny the. Oh. <laughs> I, have no I can neither def- confirm nor deny my level of sobriety on that evening. It might have been actually. It was in full of Miss Drenor, actually. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Little tidbit of lore. Drenor, Here it is. You... Lord Lord Ca- in six seventy eight. Uh, Lord Councillor Caris Madrim and his hunting party, which included several humans of note, mysteriously disappear off the coast of Del Santo. So that's uh, off the Wizard's Coast. During a grand hunt of the near legendary Greater Quelzar, agents of Unther are suspected in the attack, as are some of Lord Mayor Dream's usual political foes. 
All right, so they might not have actually Becky. found the Quelzar. <laughs> That's right. They <laughs> might, might have just been assassins. The only survivor of that was a lowly page looking for some, um, you know, a leg up in, in court. So he laid claim that all these nobles died hunting the Quelzar, and when really they all just got severely potted and fell into a stream and drowned. <laughs> <laughs> It's all, and he took, much less and he took their than we stuff. They took their stuff. That's right. The thing, the thing that I'm glad about though is that Eric Boyd is concentrating on the north because if he was concentrating <laughs> on the Wizards Coast, he would make about 87 pages out of that reference. So you know, <laughs> yeah. we have to be thankful for small mercies. He still might. <laughs> he still might. Yeah. He still might. Please do not give any ideas. To yeah. Anytime you have a reference in a timeline that so and so died under such legendary possibilities, there's a 50 50 chance it's just a load of BS. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's your love of comic books coming out, Stephen. They're never dead until you see the body. That's right. And even then, even then, it's a 50 yeah. chance. <laughs> until you see the body and personally <laughs> light it on fire yourself. From that's Volo, right. you know, oh, there's Mont Volo. And what's that place? Oh, that's Volo Bog. Oh, that's a, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and TSR did the same thing at the Obscure Death Rule. It's all the way through the Dragonlance modules. Oh. Because the only way to keep characters alive when you have player characters murder hoboing in all directions <laughs> and you need those characters to run the later module is have obscure death so there's actually a page and a half on obscure death like really this is how this character might not have actually died yeah you have to make sure they fall over a cliff or something <laughs> so that you cannot recover the body into and, the bottomless well yeah taken and, or, swept away by a dragon yep. disappeared in a burst of flame now yep. there's there would be a cool magic item. Anytime you swing this weapon with a critical hit, a fog bank surrounds you and your foe disappears. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You have a totally obscure death, but you don't have to deal with it anymore. <laughs> the halberd of obscure death. <laughs> yeah, there was something like that. There was something like that in Dragon Years, very early Dragon, and it was a ring that basically every time you got killed, it would heal you and create an illusion of you dying whilst yes. you, and make you invisible. I remember you that. Ran off. Oh man. Jeez, <laughs> oh, I'm trying to find it. Uh, okay. Like okay. Two. Okay. No, it's so we're in a dungeon. Of, all right. This is a bad, <laughs> this is a bad thing for me to say, but it's starting to sound like a fourth edition magic item. Go with me for a second. Oh God. Now, the description on 4th edition magic items would go something like, okay, when you crit with this weapon, you may spontaneously disappear and appear to have died and in reality turn invisible until you attack or cast a spell. This lasts until the end of your next turn, right? That's what it would say. <laughs> and when you crit, you may do these things. Or when you spend a healing surge, you may do these things, right? That kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, we want to leave 4th edition out of this. <laughs> hey, I played 4th edition oh, quite happily for many years. I just I, want to say. You know, it's Love funny. We, we, I mean, I tried, and Curry can attest this. I bought the books. We got together, and we played one, like, one session of 4th edition. And my players were like, I hate this. I hate it. I See, hate that's it. what you did wrong. Yeah. You I didn't have me as your DM. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I don't know. I've been DN since 1978. I think I'm pretty good at it now. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not a matter of skill. It's a matter of perspective. Well, that's true. I didn't like fourth edition to begin with. So, see, there you go. <laughs> well, we had just worked on third edition. They came out with 3.5, and we're like, okay, we can't have. Then fourth edition, we're like, wait, 3.5 is still wet. What are you doing to it? <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> and all the these cards not are yet. no longer <laughs> right. tournament legal. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like playing Pokemon. What do you mean I can't? use this deck god damn it <laughs> what do you mean i can't drop three dark rituals on the first round and win the battle in three rounds exactly. what do you mean okay i i have a question to drag this back to magic items discussion <laughs> so oh, you're in the dungeon has, so you're in the dungeon that's right who has not dropped one at least one if not more of those magic items from the D D cartoon series into their game 
<laughs> the ranger with that energy bow. <laughs> oh my god! Wait, no, wait. I have never seen the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon series. It never came to Australia. Didn't George? Oh. Wait, didn't Bob write that into sure. Canterbury? Didn't? Didn't? Wasn't that Arrow the same thing? Palmerill? <laughs> yeah, yeah Palmerill. I mean, kind of. <laughs> it is. It's close. Yeah. Wow, way to de-romanticize Patty <laughs> Breeze's character. Well, thank you, you but compromised but... her entire arc, Jeff. <laughs> uh, you just go back and watch the cartoon and just go, damn it, that's where he got it from. Come on. <laughs> it it's hit called the... a homage. That's right. Not a oh. compromise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll give it to you. I'll All give right. it to you. Right. I thought you said All farage right. there for a second. Like, leave cheese out of it. What are you doing? Okay, so we need a cheese-based magic item. <laughs> the, the, fond, the fate of fond, the fondue fate or something. Clearly, it's got to be a knife, right? Oh, there it's you go. It's made for cutting cheese. Cutting so it's plus cheese. one, plus four against cheese-based monsters. Doesn't it, doesn't that go with the 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 reverse uh, fire fire breathing thing to cut the cheese? Uh, oh, no. Okay, so it's also a dwarf based, a uh, dwarf <laughs> created guy. So bad, yeah. so bad doing this. We <laughs> tried. Okay, while you hold this item, you are impervious to cheese uh, smell related attacks. You are immune to lactose based attacks. What's it called? The Blade of Gouda? <laughs> no, that's all right then. You're immune to stinking cloud. And... There you go. It's just, it's just called the Gouda Blade. There you go, the Gouda Blade. There you go. And you're immune to, yeah, you're immune to poison gas. Poison gas, right? like stinking cloud, and uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you have uh, additional plus two to attack and damage roll against cheese-based creatures. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. you know, I should have okay. known. I should have known better. I had this grand idea a few weeks ago to put together this show. The, the, the a few weeks ago, this is like two years ago, Jeff. I know. This is I know. this. Uh, this that actually that item works well in Return to Castle Greyhawk. I think that's going to be just perfect. That's right? Like cheese golems and whatever that's true. That that's there. true. I thought we get together. We we make these grand magical items. And there we are cutting the cheese, shitting Look, out fireballs. <laughs> there was there was a whole episode of the Westgate Irregulars campaign that uh, like there was a half hour spent about various exotic cheeses. So, <laughs> um, but to take your point, Jeff, I mean it's it's fun to randomly discuss magic items, etc., right. and make stuff up on the fly and just come up with something random. But but and it's a big but for me because. Magic items to me have always been special, and I and I, and I say that because not for the in-game use, because I until more recently I'd never played for a long, long, long time. Right. But seeing Ed's magic items, um, for <laughs> example, his Seven Swords article in you know right. Dragon way back in the day, and the story and the history behind them. That to me was way more exciting than how many pluses it had, or oh, whether no, it functioned as a you. bag of holding, etc. And as part of that, and, and I found that out to my own detriment at little bits of times, was you've got to have a plan when you do a, a magic item like that. You've right, got right. to um, Absolutely. think about when you're, if you're doing it in the realms uh, or Greyhawk or Dragon, or any of the game worlds, any of the set campaign worlds, or your own game world, you know, your own homebrew campaign world that you're so proud about and is you know, fantastic and you've added a huge layer of detail into. It's got to be consistent and... Sometimes you you will throw in a throwaway reference to a, a place or a dragon or whatever, and you think, yeah, that sounds cool. But when you have to come back to it and fit it into something, it's not so easy. <laughs> right. Um, oh, right. I just call George Crashovs and Eric Boyd. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, it's got to play into the setting and yeah. the theme. I mean, I, the I look at my it. I look at my first ever article that got published in Dragon Two Seven Seven, which was my Saugas legacy article uh, with the Swords of Impulter, which was an unashamed riff off uh, Ed's, you know, Seven Swords article. And what I found was I put in all this stuff and all these references and I was really proud of myself until two years later I had to construct the history of Impulter and went, ooh, Oh, I don't like how that. Oh, I don't like that name, or etc., etc., etc. Unforeseen consequences. Yeah, unforeseen right. consequences. So, if if you are looking to make a magic item in the Ed Greenwood style, um, I think it's really important to think about stuff. Or if you're going to reference something, make it, and you're not clear about what it is, make it 
slightly more generic. So right, as soon right. as you mm-hmm. lock down, leave yourself this is wiggle in, room. Yeah, lock, as soon as you say, well, this was you know uh, a king's sword in Westgate, you're instantly narrowing yourself down. Uh, as soon as you're saying, you know, this is a part of the horde of Klaus the dragon, you're going, okay, well, we're going to work that in, etc. Whereas right, it's right. always better to make stuff up, make up a dragon name, make up a kingdom name, but don't say where it is. That's always the best stuff. Because then someone will grab that reference and put it into their Forgotten Realms and tell you where that kingdom is when they do their stuff. And so that's always the fun part. Of course, it does lead to our long discussions at 1am in the morning from people like Eric Boyd on Messenger who keep asking you, what about this place? Or what about this guy? Or, what about this offhand this? reference that you made? You see, you see <laughs> me when now. I was a young, impressionable boy, I I remember reading something in my father's study about <clears throat> a guy in the British Foreign Office in uh, very early in Victorian times who would make up kingdoms and places around the world and then draw money from the exchequer for an expedition to this yeah. fictitious place. And um, he made quite a good living out of it. Nice. And having having watched certain American political parties, which I shall not name, do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that be. It still um, it still works, and obviously the the globe still has many lost and undiscovered kingdoms just waiting for your campaign and your intrepid player characters to stumble into them at which point they will need magic items to save their butts. So, you're in the dungeon. <laughs> nice. Good Eric, job, Ed. Eric, you had no idea you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna coin that phrase, did you? <laughs> uh, it was it was years ago that I coined it. I'm just spreading it at this point. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Sp- spread like a disease. Way, right to the edges. <laughs> oh, no. No, believe me. I had no aspirations of actually creating anything, anything lore-worthy tonight. It'd be nice to, but this is more just to have fun and hopefully give people who listen and watch uh, ideas for their campaign, you know, and hopefully Eric. You are so to... lucky you said that without Eric Boyd here. <laughs> I know he's he's joining in a few minutes. I had to get that yes, out. I know. Get it out now, because <laughs> he ain't going down that road. No, nope, there he is. Oh, no, no, he's not. No, I mean, for example, every item we've gotten in our game on Saturday night has literally like six paragraphs of lore behind it. You know, uh, and like, mm-hmm. well, we did a whole video, ten minute video on yours, George. Your your crown of twin twin flames. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of the rabbit holes that you can go down. The other day, we were talking about the Crypt Garden and South Crypt Dungeons in the Crypt Garden, and Eric had a period of time that he wanted to fill, and he wanted to fill it with a green drag. And so we got a green dragon that we'd referred to earlier in the history of the North. And that green dragon came out of the high forest. So we were instantly in the high forest. And then we started talking about the green dragons of the high forest. And then we started talking about um, the big red dragon, Inferno, in the high forest. And then we started talking about the Aarakocra that are in the star mounts, because that's where the red dragon is, Inferno. And I commented to Eric, isn't it weird that Inferno, this massive, most powerful red dragon in all of Faerun, let's see Zarakokra just calmly wander around his domain without getting rid of them or touching them. He's either doesn't care about them or somehow he can't touch them. And that's when the spidey sense started tingling. And so, can't touch that. And so, can't touch that. And so I wrote up a three-page artifact which the game stats are two paragraphs and the history is <laughs> to explain why, in a nutshell, to explain why he can't touch the Aarakocra of the Star Mounts. <laughs> and it took us to um, the, the land that Inferno hunts, which is through a gate in um, th- that goes to the continent far to the west of uh, Faerun. And it dealt with, um, you know, the green why the green dragon... Um, I can't say that. Too hard, Ed. Sorry. So Sorry. Um, the, the green <laughs> dragon that's eating all the Aarakocra, why is it doing it? Well, it wants to get its hands on the artifact because it wants to take on Inferno, etc. Et tastes like chicken. So, yeah, it tastes like chicken. <laughs> Elacrimalicros. 
Yeah, like Crimalacross. Crim but we never did. Yeah. That never happened. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Game. Right, that one. Cool. That one. Yeah, I like Crimalacross. I like the way it rolls yeah. off the tongue. Um, it been easier to just say the dragon's been asleep the entire time the Arakakra have been there and haven't <laughs> noticed them yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the but where's the fun in that? <laughs> the dragon, the dragon's, the dragon's been keeping them around, hoping they'll... <laughs> The dragon's been the dragon has been breeding them Ooh, for because food. he wants free pets and food. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, the dragon has been keeping him around because he's like, um, they have feathers. They should be laying eggs. I like eggs. Yep. And and that uh, by what's way, going that's, on, you freeloaders? <laughs> that's that's one of the things that TSR censored out of the realms from the very beginning. Laying eggs. Many many of my dragons had alpine valleys in which they'd introduced livestock in so they'd have their own private food stores <clears throat> and they said we're not putting that in the game a, it's boring uh, hi and b it, it's it's immoral I like and i said why is it immoral i mean you're in the middle of wisconsin for christ's sake <laughs> surrounded by <laughs> dairy herds and stuff are you vegan? Important. Are you vegan? I didn't yeah, think so. so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they say, good. but, but, you know, that's somehow immoral. Do they do it with sentient creatures? I said, of course, they're dragons. Well, that's really immoral. Do any of them do it with humans? I said, of course. And they said, oh, that can't go in the game at all. <laughs> We can't have people examine their own lifestyle. I mean, come on, Ed. After Shandra, There's escapism. Come on. Yeah, you know, after yeah. Chandra, what do you expect? <laughs> come on, come on, Eric. If you, if it offers you any comfort for the time that you've arrived, they've accomplished absolutely zero. Absolutely. I was hoping so. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. There are three deathless magic items that Eric can now take away when he's That's in right. the dungeon. We came up with the with the Gouda blade. We came up with blade. the. Uh, the potion of butt blasting and came up with the <laughs> Librum of Ineffable Damnation. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they all seem about the same. Yeah. <laughs> we gave you enough uh, story ideas for that Librum to uh, fuel your campaign for a year now. I mean, oh, yeah, I mean... definitely. <laughs> Season two. That's right. The ins and outs of the Librum of Ineffable Damnation. That's kind of a long title. I'll workshop it. It's fine. Workshop. How many owners can you go through in your game before they realize something's going on, right? Well, there are five of them, so five. <laughs> Season two, lick the book. We had we had six, but one of them has already succumbed to corruption and flown off on bone wings. So mm. you're very lucky. You're a very lucky, Eric, with a C, because Jeff was just spouting heresy before. So, oh, you know, oh, yeah, the timing true. is well. I should probably so mention. So the reason I'm late is because I was DMing uh, the kids' campaign. And they right. all followed me, and they're watching the Twitch now. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, Eric's kids. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. They're not all my kids. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's Hi, <laughs> Eric's gamer kids. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Did you oh, want to give the line, Eric? Or did you, Jeff, did you want to give the line? <laughs> uh, so, so for, to our so, new viewers, you're in the dungeon. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. You're in the dungeon. <laughs> and unfortunately, like your hobby is gaming, not post hole digging. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Wait a <laughs> so, hey, I wanted to update that. you. I wanted to update you, Jeff and Curry, about my schedule. It turns out I can hang around for a little bit longer. Oh, but oh good. Yay, I know good. you wanted to ask the other Eric. Some oh, wait, more questions. Only inside, one so. Eric. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Only alternate one of us. We have achieved <laughs> the Ericing. That's right. <laughs> it's okay. Rather than keep saying Eric, Eric, I think there's our Eric. It's got to be who's our first Eric. So, but first Eric is clumsy. So we'll just call Eric with a C Shorty, and then we know who we're talking about. So that works well. That works for Seems me. Seems fair. <laughs> You know, interestingly enough, there are people that I work with, colleagues who I know and have known for years who are absolutely convinced that my actual name is Scott. And so they just call me <laughs> Scott. Like that's 
That's totally normal. And <laughs> I probably don't help out by answering to it. <laughs> I should probably say, no, Eric is fine. I just go, yeah. So <laughs> that's like, that's you like can the... call me Scott if you like. It's like the necromancer from the from the Holy Grail. Some people call yeah, me. You can call me Tim. 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 <laughs> that's right. <laughs> You should tell I used, that. To, I, used to, I used to play a mud where the wizard character class had titles, so etc. And there was a guy, and every level had a different title, a la first edition D and D. So there was a character a guy who played Tim, and it was Tim the Enchanter was his mud title, and he never moved past six level because he wanted to stay Tim the Enchanter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hang, hang around in the tavern, chat around, never went on any quests, didn't do any fighting, never got any XP. He oh, just wanted to stay as Tim the Enchanter. Can you like blame him? <laughs> college that never take that last prerequisite so they don't have to graduate right <laughs> you know you know that t- the, the, the and they can continue withdrawing money from granddaddy's trust fund for the rest of their life yeah, and, and y'all, y'all probably know this but i'm going to say it anyway but the, the that line when he said some call me tim was not the name of the of the enchanter it was something yeah. he couldn't pronounce so and he couldn't first, remember. He couldn't remember. And the first thing they came to him was Tim. That's why there's a pause. But he goes, some people call me Tim. Because <laughs> he, he couldn't remember well, the it's name. Like a, it's like a question, right? It's like some people call me Tim. Tim? <laughs> That's right. Because he couldn't remember the name or something. Yeah, that was it. It was That was really funny. But Eric, I don't think you – did you see the chat? That's what Stephen put in there for you? No, I did not. Is there a question? Oh, no, the other him? Eric. Sorry, Eric with a K. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Oh no. We're Eric Heavy. <laughs> We're Eric Heavy. Uh, okay. Your subtitle for season two should be Don't Use That, that for a Bookmark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you shouldn't have. You have oh, to look, my a... dog has decided to oh. photobomb. Oh, hey, puppy. Nice. oh, hey, puppy. You have to think of a good, a good color for that page. That's all. This is Cakes a licking. Never magic lick a magic item. item. Never familiar. lick a magic item. <laughs> hey, okay, look, Persephone, I'm, I'm hanging, don't you know where he's been? I'm hanging out with the gaming dudes. You gotta, yeah. you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go, go. Be cool. Stop putting peanut butter through your beard, Eric. Jeez. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. All right. <laughs> All right, so I'm lost. What are we talking about? Okay, right now, actually, magic we're, items. We're giving, More you know, importantly, why am I the only one without a beard in this lineup? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a personal choice, George. Talk and thought, what if we talk about magic items for your familiars or your animal companions? Oh, yeah. You mean like an owl? <laughs> no, no, no. I want to know about magic items if you have a magical pony named Bill. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay. I thought I told you to kill Bill. No, Bill is still alive and has not yet returned, but will be doing so in a dramatic fashion. Assuming they kill the ghost dragon, okay, and he okay. will li- Bill will lift his tail, and the <laughs> wand that's stored up there will fire. <laughs> so we have to come up with the wand. Well, when Bill comes back, he'll, he'll be wearing the saddlebags of glory. How's that? Saddlebags of glory. All yeah. right. <laughs> Is that what we're calling them now? That's right. They have holes in them. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Bill don't hope for manna from heaven, but they wait for the road apples. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> See, this is interesting because you said magic items for your familiar. And I thought, does he mean familiars wielding magic items or does he mean familiars that are magic items? Uh, well, I've never gone that far. You know, that I hmm. never give a cat a wand. <laughs> cross that line, Stephen. Cross that line. <laughs> What? Never give a cat a, a never give a cat a weapon. He he hates everybody. He'll kill even you. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know. Now I have this image of of Kelvin walking around with a black staff, and every time he does something, the staff goes really. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do that? <laughs> Kelvin's, a, Kelvin's a cat person, isn't he, Stephen? He likes cats. <laughs> or just says in a disappointing tone. Cat. No, no, I like cats. I'm a cat person. Kelvin. I didn't hear the question. <laughs> isn't doesn't isn't Kelvin a cat person? Doesn't he like cats? Uh, never I thought really he gives layer owls a gift you know of that, a kitten uh, or something. I once there was a brief mention. I think I made some reference to him having an owl familiar once upon a time, in which lifetime I never stated. But uh, uh, he seems more like he probably has a Tressum familiar. 
A what? I say a Tressum. Oh, that was nameless. That was uh that was other characters. Familiar, but uh though no, uh I don't know, just from a thematic thing, I'm sure he he almost wishes he could be a druid just to get a wolf animal companion. But mm -hmm. <laughs> So maybe that's, if you want a magic item that can become a familiar, I think you've got to merge it with figurines of wondrous power because everybody likes figurines of wonder, wondrous power, particularly if they turn into wolves or panthers. Um, but it would be cool if you could get one that also had familiar abilities at the same time. Because that way you could really pull them out when you needed to. It'd be a, a magic closet. Item. Yeah. Well. A closet. <laughs> <laughs> Him. Um, so, so George, and him, did, yeah. George, we do. Did, did we suffice on your um, your sword? Yeah, yeah. I think we're happy with the sword of holding. That was good. That was good. The sword of holding. So what we're doing, Eric, is we're we're coming up with magical items. And we're using the first edition DMG, rolling on on random tables to put together okay. magical items. So, uh, what's a magical item you like to see created? It doesn't have to be something with a thirty page lore behind it. Or anything. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> the hell you say? <laughs> I not say that to anyone except Eric. Why? <laughs> What's wrong with you? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm, actually, I love it when you, I love hey, I love it when you put together the lore on these things. It's, you know, hey, come on, we got the crown of twin flames. Okay, so uh, what's a what's a magic item you'd like to see? Magic item I'd like to see. Um, I would like to see. A floating eye that uh, was extracted from a beholder and now sort of looks like it's been petrified into some sort of crystal ball, but it doesn't necessarily need to be something you scry with. It could be almost anything. The big eye or a little eye? It's about a foot in diameter. That's the big oh, okay. eye. That's, That's the big, big eye. eye. Yeah, the big eye. You already wrote that up? Mm. Yuthla, the eye of the beholder. Not that one. Yeah, that was yeah. that was Wait, the nineties. No, <laughs> and what the eye of Savers we're carrying around with us already. Yep. <laughs> so does this floating eye contain beauty? Can contain beauty everyone? is in the eye of the we go. Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> oh. Let's so let's bad. give it a uh, curry roll on the roll of uh, percentile dice for me. Let's see what it's going to have. One of the one of the um, qualities so of it. <laughs> We're just doing a random... 32. 32. Let's see. Um, Charm Monster. Oh. Or giant, a giant. Specific, it says specifically giants, but it doesn't have to be. I like actually Charm Giants. You do? Then it could, yeah, because it could be a relic of the Dragon War from 25,000 years ago. Um, nice. And it was... Uh, actually not extracted from a beholder. It was extracted from one of the Titans. Oh, and, oh wow, man. Um, <laughs> it was used by the dragons to lure companies of giants into traps because they would have to follow it uh, wherever the Titan's eye led them. And then the dragons would attack from uh, high vantage points. And is that going to be the primary function? And should there be ancillary things that come along with it? I think there should be more. Okay. okay. How many more how many more powers do you think an item of this caliber in this age Two. should have? It Two should more? have a total of three. Okay. All right, Curly, you, three. Curly, roll again and let George pick a table. Okay. The yeah. uh, uh, yeah, artifact table, let's go. Okay. I'm okay. good with it being an artifact. <laughs> I love it. But wait, I didn't detail what happened to it over the twenty five thousand years. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That'll be later, Eric. I, I told you. I wanted you here for the lore, so you'll you'll be able to write up those There's ten lore. pages. <laughs> Fifty nine, George. Fifty nine is oh, that fits perfectly, but it's a bit boring. Um, miscellaneous Magic DMG First Edition Table Two is Crystal Ball. Perfect. It operates as a Crystal Ball. Nice. What type of Crystal Ball, Eric? Um. <laughs> I'm going to say it allows you to scry, but every time you scry, you can't separate the fact that you also project a nightmare. Ooh. Okay. You, you writing this down, George? <laughs> I'm going to have to write it up. That's, that's the part <laughs> I hope you do. See, I hope you do. Just, the tears are streaming right now because I just know that I'm going to have to write this up. <laughs> 
You guys are oh, killing me. Now. You guys are killing me. How does this thing lure giants? Is it a, a sonic thing? Do you like tap it and make it ring? Here, giant. Here. Here. <laughs> It, it winks at them. You you blow into it like a whistle. <laughs> ah, <laughs> magic users have crystal balls. Hmm. <laughs> Stephen just gave us the perfect name for our next podcast. Uh, yes, Ed. It's called uh, what is it? But wait, there's lore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> it is good. I love it, Stephen. <laughs> Fifty part series. I want to make another website. <laughs> Fifty part series, and each one has a subset underneath it, right? Yeah. So, in 50, in fifty parts, we could get through the history of the item. Yes, that's going to be the title <laughs> of your DM Skilled release. Oh yes, there you go. Uh, but, but wait, wait there's, there's lore. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Book yeah. one. <laughs> that's right. Book one of of two hundred. Yeah. All right. What's so. the third power? Third power. Okay, Curry, give us another roll. And another roll. Let's see. And I'll I'll pick I this just one found here. Something evil. <laughs> Ninety-one. That never happens. <laughs> Ninety-one. Oh my god. Ninety-one. Uh, resist. It, it creates a resist fire in ten foot radius. That is because <coughs> um, the general of the dragon armies uh, is a red dragon named Nagamot. And when you hold the Titan's Eye, it summons the aura of Nagamot and it cloaks you like a fire shield. How do you do this? And the, cur <laughs> and the curse is, you are cursed to be followed by a one-eyed Titan staggering around, holding its eye socket, going, I want it back! Where is it? You have it! Oh, or it could be if you ever if you ever in the if you ever in the vicinity or get put in front of a titan, it's an immediate hatred for you because you have one of the eyes of their ancient people. Mm -hmm. So Actually, just because I have to write this up, Eric, just quickly, the nightmare part is that the spell nightmare or a thing from the abyss nightmare. Uh spell. Okay, affecting the wielder or anyone else? No, no, whoever you're scrying. Oh, okay. So you can't not give them a nightmare while you're scrying them. Oh, that's okay. perfect. And uh, to, build, to build on Ed's <laughs> idea, the uh, Titan that they took the eye from, he still exists. Yes. But he's Thanks been... Thanks for the doc, George. He's been <laughs> uh, transformed. In, he's been petrified. He's been transformed into a mountain. And so there is a certain mountain in the spine of the world that if you look at it at just the right angle, it looks like a huddled Titan with his hand almost over his empty eye socket, but you can actually climb inside the cavern system by going through the eye socket. And what's in the eye socket if they ever do? No one's ever returned. Oh. Mm. Coming oh, to man. a module near you. Coming to oh, a module near you. Thank God no one's ever returned. That's going to make that part easy in the write-up. No one's ever returned. <laughs> Other than the following 250 yeah, uh, realms yeah, that's NPCs. Right. That's <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, that's why they need the heroes to come in. Okay, perfect. There you go. The, and what did we call this? What was the name of it? Eye of the Titan. It's Eye of the Titan. Is that like with a theme song or what? Yeah, oh, that's Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> you gotta kind of go like this when you're doing it. <laughs> We've been here for fifty years, folks. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> the, the, best, the best part about that, Eric. The best part about that, Eric, is that half an hour ago, Ed said. The one monster, or the two monsters in the original first edition monster manual that no one ever went near were Tritons and Titans. <coughs> there you go. Bang. Now I mean, nobody ever Titan. went near the Thought Eater either, but it didn't need a huge culture and cities and stuff. Mm. Those other two did. So you did use the Throat Leech then, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> really? Oh, yes. <laughs> the Wolf in Sheep's Clothing? I'd use uh, that one too. Mm. Oh, jeez. I've used rod, rod grub. Yeah, I use those too, and green slime even. But, but I always to use those as vehicles that nasty spellcasters would use to inflict magic on people that they couldn't get to otherwise. Yeah, I just like to have a dissolving statue that turns into a gr rot grub swarm. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even breathe that. Yes, oh. you do. Yes, you as do. a matter of fact. Yes, I like surprisingly it. agile for a bunch of rot grub. I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're just slow. You're a dwarf. 
<laughs> Moving on. <laughs> All right, Steve. All right, let me let me intercede. Looks Here. like I got to take off. So it was good hanging out with all of you. Thank, Thank you. you Thanks for coming, Eric. Yeah, Eric. Good Thanks chat. for the ideas. Yeah. Good luck with the more magic items. Eric Boyd, you are now officially the only Eric. In this Uh-oh. Book. And, and I feel hey, like I've grown a foot. Exactly, you have. <laughs> Let us know what happens what? With, the book, with the book. Two feet can, aren't enough for you? You, exactly. can have, you can have one of mine. Eric, and so are we. <laughs> <laughs> he can use the sword on you, Eric. There you go. Yeah. See you all later. Well, Bye. Let us know Bye. what happens with the book. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Great to see you. Thanks for coming, Eric. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Stephen, it's your turn. Uh. Okay. What kind of item I, would you like to see? I have a see? concept into which nearly anything can fit, which is that's what she said. Once upon a time, <laughs> Kelvin, <laughs> Kelvin, for several decades, used to make the final graduating exam for any apprentice to be to come up with a new item. He hasn't seen before. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> there's a reason that quite a few of them remain locked away. <laughs> <laughs> but the concept just it, I it, like George, you know, the the whole seven swords thing that got me sucked into the realms too is just it's great to have a story behind anything but if you have something that coming at it from the opposite angle there could be a story reason for all sorts of different things so instead of here is a sword and this is its story it's here is a story concept how do we work it in and add to that it could you know you could take that concept and say Nearly anything, like uh, the the guild of uh, mages and protectors, you have to make something that the guild can mass produce for some uh, for some of its senior wizards to use, or you know all that sort of thing. It can so, be any, any item, any kind of item. Any kind of item, sure. Okay, see you here. But it would probably be easiest to work from. Either, you know, something wearable, <laughs> something that you can enchant. So it would be something that a, uh, you know, that an apprentice would be able to afford to get made and then enchant themselves. So a ring, a bracer, uh, you know, or a blade, something like that. Okay, Curry, Curry, roll. Uh, well, let's roll. Let me see what comes up here. Okay. Yeah. 31. 31, 31, 31. Let's see. Scroll. Uh, that's, uh, is, that, is that a scroll? Wait, what? Is that a, <laughs> no, is that, a, is that a scroll or is that an item? Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the magic 31 item. 31 would be a scroll, yeah. Scroll. So we need to go to um, another the other page here and roll again. Well, a, a spell would be certainly fit the uh, bill of something new that hasn't been seen before. So it could, you yeah. know. Okay. Oh, we're going to create a new spell. That would be good. I'm down for that. I actually, I actually had an idea when Stephen no, talked about it. Be, but <laughs> well, I, so I have an idea. So Stephen had uh, mentioned the Guild of Wizards and sort of like the ability to do something cool. And I was thinking of a description in your novel, Blackstaff, about Danthra's spell before she um, uh, <laughs> was altered, oh yes. but, a, but a weaker version of it. What if like you had a first level spell mm -hmm. and it's not really identify, but it what it does is it, re it replays a powerful memory of um, an emotionally intense event that, it, that happened in the vicinity of the magic item you're touching. So you find a sword and you touch it and you cast the spell and you realize that you see the scene where this sword is used to stab the king. You know, uh -huh. something, something intense that happened. So you don't have any control over it. You just get one sort of echo or memory uh, that surrounds the concept of the sword from some point in its history. And it might have 25,000 years that are fully detailed. But anyhow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that would work. Honestly, if somebody came up with that spell, 
if it were within the guild, they would probably use it just as is. If it were made by one of Kelvin's apprentices, he's a, that's a nice idea. Fine tune it a little. <laughs> yeah. Add level. Make it so it's not necessarily the most powerful memory attached to it. Show me who wielded this weapon when it was yep. last used to kill something. That is a spell that can be put to use by the watch. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a right. good point. And, wow. I, and I actually... Lying in an alley. Here's I actually a wrote a, a thing you. like that and sent it in, and the TSR editors killed it for that reason. For what reason? Because it'll solve too, too many murders? Too pow- Yeah, too powerful unbalances the game. That has to go away. Interesting. So that I made it go away. Huh. I think it would be fun from a novelist perspective. Right. Oh, yeah. We're going to bring it to life here. So what, what can we call this spell? Uh, why don't we name it after Danthra just to be, uh, you know, um, it was an early version of it. Uh, <coughs> um, Danthra's Echo Wind. There we go. Okay. That works for me. All right, to give your character another spell, Stephen? I'm trying to think of what would work for her. and uh, I'm thinking like a first-level spell. A first-level spell? Um, one memory, uncontrolled. This was the early version, not necessarily the one that you were saying. Just it shows you one random memory with an in- intense emotion surrounding it that the item was involved in. Hmm. Okay, now you have to go and look at legend lore and make sure Mm -hmm. that if it's lower level, it's less utility. That's why I was thinking only one, and you can't control it at all. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hmm, I'm debating about trying it to emotion rather than to a specific action or state of being. So, yeah, I don't know. The last time... You know, this thing, the last time this was wielded in hatred, what do you see? You know, or. I like that. I think that starts to bump it up in level. Right. Oh, that would bump it up a level, I suppose. Hmm. I suppose if you if you don't specify the emotion, anytime this was wielded with extreme emotion, it doesn't matter what, you know. Yeah, it could have been happiness. Right. 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 Oh, I'm so happy to kill these orcs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't necessarily have to be that either. It could be just that, you know, the person holding it had to happen to have a really good day. <laughs> that never what happens. These are murder hobos. That's right. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> okay, so Danther's Echo, Echo Wind, W-I-N-D. Yeah, okay. Like Rewind. Right, right. Echo Wind. I like it. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So, Ed, the man, the man himself. What kind of magic item would you like us to see? Like us to do? A nose ring. A hey. nose ring. Nose, <laughs> nose ring of coddling. You know, I was always most partial. Although it's fun to do major artifacts with fifty-six powers, and then a power <laughs> that happens when the moon is full. And then bad side effects that slowly eat away at your character that you don't realize until it's too late. Although all of that stuff is tremendous fun for the Dungeon Master, I always think of the children. (laughs) No, I always think of... (laughs) I always like to think of the first level players. And wouldn't it be nice to have a dagger that will glow on command like a lantern? And that if you drop it or hit it against something, it's always velvety silent. So it doesn't clatter and it doesn't ring. You know, something really minor and counts, uh, even though it doesn't get any pluses to hit, it counts as a plus four silver one Mm. for purposes of what creatures it can hit. Right. And... It allows you to roll twice on damage. So you've got this tiny little dagger, 1d4 in in early editions of the game. Mm -hmm. Except you can 1d4 twice. 
Oh, I like that. And no, and no special are you rolls. Scrolls or you add them. <laughs> you you add them. Okay. So you you can do the double damage with it all the time. And um in the early editions of the game, this would be misused by thief characters terribly. Because they do their backstabbing and they get this and they do that and then they'd stack all the damage. So I would be thinking about some way to nerf it for thieves only. Because what I really wanted to do is to be carried by that poor first level magic user who could get killed by falling down the pit trap. Mm. <laughs> who had one spell and one for the rest point. of Yeah, right. Oh, for the rest of the expedition they held the lantern for everybody else and said, hi, I am a target. Hi, I am a defenseless target. <laughs> I actually had one that fired their spell, turned around and tripped and fell down a gully and, and ah. died. <laughs> and, and that's the other thing I would put in as a power. It automatically has feather fall when you're falling. Just feather fall comes on. So um, all purpose knife, yeah? Mm. For the for the uh, junior adventurer, for the yeah, junior? no, it's and, perfect. It's perfect. And the pommel unscrews, and there's a hole. There's a, a cavity inside the hollow grip. So, oh, like a Rambo like, knife. If you want to keep your lock picks or uh, your just your front door key, mm -hmm. or uh, a material component for a spell. Like your your pinch of bat guano <laughs> that you need, or your feather, or whatever it is, you can you can carry them in the in the dagger. One one or two tiny material components. All right, let's throw some aesthetics in there. Um, what what is the representative color of, of the if the, if there's an army in Sembia, what colors do they wear? Ah, uh, Sembia. There's a bunch of them, but if you want it, okay. Here's the thing. You would want this blade not to stand out. Okay, that's fine. It, so you it, could, wanna... be, it could be an innocuous color. It could be something muted. Yeah, and I would say non-reflective, too. Okay. Uh, so so pick, a, pick an innocuous, non-reflective color. Maroon. Maroon. And do, do this, does the Sambian soldiers or armies have a, a mascot or a title like the, uh, the Purple Dragons are obviously Purple Dragons? Um, well, in Zambia, it's the raven and silver. So, Flint money grubbers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. So, uh, what they would use as a thingy, there'd be representations of coins. Okay. Um, where the qu where the quillens, where the the cross bar meets the blade, you'd probably have a a miniature three coin thing there. Okay. Um, so I would sides. I would I would say make it uh, that color knife in a muted color. It's mm -hmm. unreflective, and we'll just call it the Sembian Army Knife. Instead of a Swiss Army Knife, the Sembian sure. Army Knife. Yeah. And with the uh, the raven and the coins on the, yeah. the hilt instead because, of the white cross. Because the Sembians have enough dough that they <laughs> they could pay for these all to be enchanted. <laughs> there you go. I have a crazy thought, though. There's one specific one, if you can find it, that little cavity that would normally hold... Uh, Bet guano or whatever. <laughs> if you blow in it, it's a whistle. And once in your lifetime, you can blow it, and it will blink you right back to the place it was forged at. Oh, wow. Ooh. Oh, nice. Nice. Wow. Adventurers love you for that. <laughs> but, this, but the dagger stays behind. Yeah. That's, yeah. If oh, you wow. Yeah. yeah. That's how it's passed on. There you go. Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> Me likey. Uh. <laughs> no, I'm just writing that down. Okay, Curry, do you want to do another Either one? That or you make it a once a month, it's a sonic attack from <laughs> blowing through the whistle on the palm of <laughs> there, there you go. No, I like the blink. It blinks the player and not the, not the knife or the dagger. Dagger just falls to the ground. Somebody else to find. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. You see, well, it's an awful lot more fun uh, doing a magic item by growing it that way than rolling on a table. Right. Rolling on a table is more gonzo fun. 
Yeah. But then you end up trying to nerf it or make it fit with each other. Right. No, no I'm just doing – I'm using the yeah. tables more flavor so we can – Yeah, yeah. Down, like we did with the bag of holding for the sword. That was yeah. perfect for that, so. Well, like, and Ed, one of the ideas that Eric and I were tossing around that we'll throw into this uh, Black Staff book we're toying with is uh, – remember the uh, Elven Land of Uveyron? Yes. The Lower Cities and all that? Uh, they used to store a lot of knowledge in, in crystalline plinths. And yep. Well, when the meteor wiped out that civilization, as it were, a lot of those crystal plinths got shattered. And those that actually, you know, even if just pieces of it survived, we, we toyed with the idea of making the shards of crystals into daggers, which they're just going to be daggers. But if you happen to lay them down on writing, they will translate it to a, a language you understand. That's the extent of their magic would be you can read stuff. <laughs> oh, nice. nice. Not magic, just, you know, you can't read Elvish, fine. This will translate it for you. <laughs> you don't know yeah, because some parties don't take a good, uh, good assortment of languages, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, what's wrong with the Luskin? <laughs> And it also won't tell you how to pronounce things, so it won't do you any good to to read a description of a spell or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there I you like go. It. That's even better. So. Okay, cool. All right. So let's go to Curry. Curry needs to come up with one. Yeah. Well, I've got um, an easier story to tell. I'll tell you about one that Jeff made for me one time. Um, because I think it's a, I think it's a, it fits like a, right just above like the beginner level item. Um, Jeff was always very good at um, describing what items looked like uh, when you acquired them. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, I, I couldn't have played a better Dritz to rip off character if I tried. It was really, <laughs> and this is, this is before anybody knew who this person was. This was not even on the radar yet. I never uh, heard of him at the time. Uh, but I was worshiping at the altar. That's, that's who I was. Um, we were in the Underdark. We were uh, having a, a many encounters with Drow. So you're in the dungeon. That's in the right. dungeon, yeah. <laughs> you're in the lobby. <laughs> and my character is... Um, only half drow come to find out after I bamped from Greyhawk into the Waste Forgotten down. Realms. Waste right. Down. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so when <laughs> when coming up across this altar, it was adorned with this sword in a shape that I had never really imagined before, but for some reason Jeff did. It had a spiral uh, entwined uh, handle. Okay. Your standard cross piece that came out into diamond edges and then as the blade came up it flared out into another diamond shaped head so it was um it was a bastard sword and inside that diamond at the top of the sword was um it was carved or embossed into the the metal um the image of like a plasma ball of lightning Oh. That sat at the top with a bolt that came singularly down the blade. So just the representation of this image on the sword and how it was just had this odd shape that expanded towards the end into the head of a diamond was very interesting to me because it wasn't your standard type of blade that I'd ever seen before. It was uh, – the stats on it were relatively simple. It was a plus three versus orcs, I believe. Otherwise, it operated off of uh, a plus one uh, works. And works. any other time. And it had one significant power is that once a day, it could the wielder could uh, cast uh, a lightning bolt spell equal to the level of the wielder. So as you progressed in level, that lightning bolt spell became stronger and stronger. And uh, it had a specific power word that had a bunch of cues in it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we decided that the way that it was pronounced was clacqua. 
Cloquara. So, so it it sounded <laughs> kind, of, kind of sounded kind of Klingon in in design. Um, so I, I know that that sword probably would have never seen the light of day uh, outside of Jeff's campaign, but I, I wanted to take this opportunity for the world to have it. So there you guys go. There you go. And uh, it clearly sounds like it was made by the Church of Talos uh, <laughs> as a way to <laughs> in, in a ga- no, no, I'm not done. Engage <laughs> in a uh, a uh, holy war against all the orcs of the north because they like to revel in the destruction. Um, unfortunately, it was uh, lost, and the uh, Drow of Erindlin found it and took it into the Underdark. And there, one of the drow converted to be a follower of Malak, who was an aspect of wild magic and an aspect of Talos. And that's why it was down in the Underduck. It was used for many years to uh, sow the, the cult of, uh, of uh, Malak amongst the drow. Mm. Wow. So there is a minor curse attached with the sword. I, I, was, uh, I almost <laughs> forgot about it. Excessive so, lore. Oh, I almost <laughs> forgot. Wait, there's lore. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the the one caveat to the sword uh, is that you had to be of drow lineage to wield it, um, and anyone that tried to um, immediately blacks out cold. They just fall completely unconscious if they're not drow. Now my character was half drow. How Jeff. Um, played that out in game no i fell (laughs) completely out but inside this unconscious state i had to fight uh i can't remember if it was like a phantom of myself or a shadow apparition uh but basically i had to fight a being in this unconscious state that had the sword and in order to come out of this state and i guess to eventually wield the sword i had to defeat uh this this creature that had it in in my mind if you will and so I did. We role played out that battle sequence, and then uh, I, I woke sometime later with the sword in my hand, and that's how I got it. So that's the one. Uh, it's the one misgiving. It's it got that minor curse. You got to be at least some drow, or you can't use it. Nice. Some drow. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> little bit in there, drow. yeah. A spider is written in the web up in the corner. <laughs> some drow. Oh, Charlotte, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bingo. We know all the references here. <laughs> We're culturally literate. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a question. Yeah. How is it we haven't seen more uh, dinosaur teeth, like the, the fang of a T-Rex used as a barbarian weapon? Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah I'm asking you because I figured... I'm asking... I'm, you, well, my answer to you is because other... Uh, people who use those dragon teeth for magic have gotten there first and snaffled them all up. Well, so the only way you're going to get them now is to kill yourself a dinosaur. Or go down to Chelf. Yeah. yeah, that's where you... Right, yeah. So all that cool island in the Sea of Fallen Stars. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Chelf is not an island. <laughs> that's right. No man is an island. Oh, boo. Oh, boo. <laughs> so we obviously have to make Eric go last, or this is never going to end. Um, hey! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I'd like to pick on Jeff, and if and if I could, um, I'd like to give him another gimme. And it shouldn't be too terribly long-winded, but if he would indulge us in talking about one of his artifacts, which is called the Shadow Lens, I think that would be an interesting uh-huh. conversation. Oh yeah. I'd like to I'd like to hear about its creation and what it does. Okay. Well let me tell you how I came about it. I was um, working in um, midnight shift for a tissue bank. I was a tissue coordinator and so basically I sat around and waited for people to die. Um, and so Kind of like kind of like Eric does in our campaign that we play on. <laughs> <laughs> so just just Ooh. waiting, and it's usually a dwarf too. So um, and I came across in Stephen and Stephen's not in the room at the moment, but Stephen's Cyclopedia Cyclopedic uh, Dictionary that he wrote that first edition. Ed, do you remember that one? 
D and D Cyclopedia. Yeah, D and D Cyc. No, no, the one he did, did. He do the one that's in the book? No, not not the one he was coming up with that we all. The Cyclopedia Magica. Yeah, no, no, it's called the. Uh, I can dig it out, but anyway, it was a book, first edition, Cyclopedia. Um, of D and D. Oh, you, the rule set for was, um high level basic D and D. You're talking about rule, rule cyclopedia. It was a white book. You remember that? The D and D cyclopedia was the best um dollar value for dollar that TSR ever produced. That and was it, that then. man over there. Yeah, that he, Stephen there, who isn't there. He <laughs> crammed. I I came into his cube while he was cramming extra tables in and downsizing the tables so they could fit more in so nothing needed to be left out oh, wow there, there you go. i was vastly impressed with that because everyone else at tsr just threw stuff away whenever they got an illustration text went out the window oh, and, I and thought this book to, is beautiful used to bug the shit out of me oh, yeah. text <laughs> went. Well, well i was re i was reading through that at dunkin donuts one night and um and i came across this passage about a lens that was a very, just a paragraph about a lens that created something called shadow oil. And it talked about it using it to, the doors would use it to find gold and jewels and ethereal stuff like that. So I came up with the shadow lens and the shadow lens is basically, it's a, it's a conical lens, kind of like a, one of those horns you'd, you'd yell into at a football game. Um, but it's created over, over a century and it has to be written in runes of different, uh, of the different gods for the for the dwarves, each rune has to be uh, sprinkled with uh, the type different types of uh, dust like diamond, emerald, ruby, that kind of thing. Um, the whole thing is prayed over, okay? Um, and they create that. And when when they pour the lens, it, it's a very it's very ritualistic. And once they create it, they put it over a mithril tower and they beat this thing down to form the cone shape. Um, so. You create this lens, and when it's put into darkness, it actually absorbs the darkness and creates a viscous oil that, when collected, they take it and paint it on their on their ships made of stone that they use to travel through the Underdark, the Toral, to find mithril and, and, and gold and... So it's basically a ship for the Earth, but they have to, they have to be painted with, these, with this oil to be able to do it. And then basically they sit... It's just like the the earth parts in front of them as they go around and they go through and find their veins and they go in and they mine the veins and and go back and you know do their stuff with it. But uh, it was one I came up for a book. I, I came up with the idea for a, in a book. The whole book was around this shadow lens in the ship that was stolen by an exiled um, Brow house from Shavaragust and and the dwarves attempt to 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 get the the ship back. Okay, for Eric's benefit, we need to know who was the first dwarf high priest who did one of these? What year in Dale Reckoning was that? Uh, what ancient dwarven kingdom were they attached to? And just simple questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> you want it now or in a little while? In a little while. <laughs> Isilar was cool, the, Jeff. Isilar was the main priest that oversaw the ritual. The high old one's name was... Um... M M no... Imar was the stone cutter. Yeah. Um, Isilar was the priest. Gadlin was the the, the the smith. The smith that forged it, and the high old one. I can't remember what I called. Igbar. 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 Okay. Igbar. And this was the book that TSR should have published and didn't. Right. Yes. They Correct. Had. Yes. 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 That, it, that it, you you gave me to read. Yes. For yes. A good book. Yes, I gave you that book to read, and they did not publish it because they didn't write books about dwarves. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was the answer. <laughs> that was my answer for Mar Mary Kirchhoff. I ran across that letter the other day, and it was like, we just don't write books about dwarves. <laughs> and I thought to myself, except Flint the Dwarf. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and the fact that I used, uh, I did uh, did a lot of cameos by some of the gods, but uh, but they, I think they played in well to the story. Because um, yeah. we had Dumathon, we had Morden, and Loth. Mm -hmm. Loth was the major antagonist in the book for, you know, turning the the one and that was yeah. the real reason it didn't get published likely exactly yeah. yeah because um they were very much into whether they admitted it or not siloing mm. in those days um bob would get to draw write about lulz nobody else right yeah right you know 
Um, and and that wasn't a uh, a gimme or whatever. That was it made the job easier for all the editors. They didn't have to worry about it. If you if you notice the early TSR novels, they geographically separated everybody just to keep us each out of each other's hair. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? The one, the one big fight I had with Mary Kirchhoff early on is she said, "Oh, you can't go into Waterdeep. Nobody can go into Waterdeep. It's just for that trilogy." And I said, "No, Waterdeep is the crossroad city." And she said. No, 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 you can't go into it. I've made the decision. And I said, no, games department overrules you because this is a games company, not a book company. <laughs> Which they found out I'm later. I'm sure she took it well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she did not take it well. But, I mean, it was like, no, we set it up that Waterdeep is the crossroad city. It's in my original turnover. Everybody's bought into that. You don't get to make this fiat decision. Mm. You know. Unfortunately. And, and, well, which was a really damn good thing because um, Waterdeep got visited so often that I, I, I was afraid the innkeepers would start raising their prices. <laughs> oh, it's, it's high season. <laughs> no. did the, you did the uh, trade off and nobody ever went back to Tantris. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Right. No, Stephen, we're talking about the, the, the encyclopedia that you did, the uh, encyclopedia, the DD encyclopedia. Yeah, yeah. I just posted a link in the Twitch. Yeah, thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was go. the editor who pulled it all together. I didn't write any of it. <laughs> yeah, but you made it. You made it happen. That's it. That's yeah. It. That's the one right there. I, I think the I thought I thought in my mind I thought it was a white book, but yeah. The the spine is white. That's yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I was remembering. That's what. I, that was such a oh my god that turned my turned my imagination over in my head and I could not stop. Uh, but I love that book. Well, thank you. I uh, love that book. I, I remember getting called on the carpet by my boss about that one because I was told that it was against the rules for me to print a table uh, landscape instead of uh, vertical. And I was like, well, if you can figure out any physical possible way to make this table work vertically, be my guest, but <laughs> you know, they printed it horizontally in every other previous existence, and I'm not changing it because, frankly, I have too many other fires to put out before we get put down. <laughs> so that took a lot of work, but yeah, the summer of 1991 disappeared while I did that. <laughs> so, but it was worth it. It's a good, good thing I did. I'm no, happy with yeah, it. Yeah, um, no, I love that book. I love that. My my earliest attempt to make make a little bit more racially and uh, gender balanced example characters in that anyway. Had a black wizard and a, a female rogue and so forth and so on, you know. Just less less generic white guys. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Good good thing. Yeah, there you go. There As you go. a generic, says the guy, guy, I generic <laughs> white guys. <laughs> I myself said, hey, and then I said, get out of my way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In other words, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> that won't work, and I'll tell you why. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> my only regret with the encyclopedia was that we didn't put a world map in there. We just kind of turn the existing hex maps into pages, and that just didn't work. It was still a good product. Good for, it still was a great book. A, a tone, but... No, it was still a great, still a great what book. You can when you're told it's primarily a reprint project. <laughs> so. I think I, I must have bought that book, oh my God, it's been 20 years ago or something like that, when I bought that book. Well, it was published in late 91, yeah. so... It have been longer than that, yeah. And, and it wasn't a lot of money then, too. It was only like 10 or $15 of them, or $19. Like I said, best value for the money they ever put out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That was, uh, yeah, I, I found I found that as, we used to have a place here called, uh, um, oh, what was that place called, Curry? Enterprise? Oh, Enterprise, 1701. It was the only yeah. place to buy books. Like, that's it. There it there is. Go. Yeah, so them. we're talking about magic items. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So you're in the dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, George. Actually, George. And, and I've got a question of Ed. Two questions, actually. 
Um, in tracking down all of his Dragon magazine articles, I came across one all the way back in Dragon 54. And, and down to Earth's so, identity? No, 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 no. It's another little one that everyone yeah. misses. And I want to know why, out of all of the articles that you had published in Dragon, Ed, this one had your full name. I have Wells Feather Tokens. I have article. no idea. You've got to remember that by then, I was a uh, contributing editor, and what that meant was I just wrote stuff um, and sent it off to Kim, unless I was being given editorial direction. Like, please review the Fiend Folio. Or, um, mm -hmm. we'd love it if you do some ecologies. Here's here's the ecologies we bought from Dragon Lords magazine that went defunct. Could you write more? And it would be really cool if you started with some cleanup crew or if you started with this. Or I would just do them. Uh, aside from those editorial things, I just wrote up stuff that tickled my fancy, that popped into my head, and I sent it off. Now, the idea of publishing a magazine back in those pre-pixel days, <laughs> when everything was done with waxers and printing out, and you literally put wax on a blank page and slapped down the text and used X-Acto knives to move stuff around, um, was you were creating the magazine in eight-page signatures and selling ads. And how long a particular issue of Dragon was depended on how much ads they'd sold. So if they sold some more ads, quick, we need another eight pages. And you literally would look around for stuff you had already written and uh, edited in-house that uh, would fill out in between all the little ads, which were the pickup ads that you could use. So I never knew when stuff was going to get published unless I'd been back and forthing with Kim about something major like the Nine Hells thing and the follow-up to the Nine Hells thing. Everything else was like I, I would write off tons of stuff and send it away. So I did. And then it just appeared. And I never knew. And probably that was given to Barb Young or somebody else who was starting. And they probably just read my name, not know who I was or anything. <laughs> I just took it and put it on the piece. So that's that's probably the answer. And, and I, I'll be right back to answer your second question. <laughs> um, I'm being called. I'll okay. Be right back. Got, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so while he... Set head pants on! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it's a good All day. Right. It's, it's a good, a good day. day. He's wearing pants. I love it. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, George, why don't we do one that's just um, just randomly rolled off of here, and y'all can, can you give it a name? How's that? Okay. Oh, good. Right, him. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's right. Okay, Curry, give me give me a roll there. Let's see what. All right. More percentile. Yeah, percentile. There we go. Everything We've in first edition is percentile. Thirty-six. Third, uh, did we have thirty-six already? No, this is a ring. Okay, so let's go to go to ring. You are such a low. You are such a low roller, Curry. You Shocking. really are. <laughs> I rolled a 91 <laughs> once. <laughs> You're rolling in second edition, which means you want the low numbers, right? Exactly. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Okay. Who uh, remembers Thacko? None of you. I do. <laughs> I remember the article that introduced Thacko. That's right. <laughs> and thinking it was an amazing idea. Yeah. I did too. <laughs> All right, Curry, another percentile dice for me. One more. Here we go. 66. 66 is, that's a ring of protection. But protection oh, okay. from what? From gnomes. No, um... <laughs> <laughs> I will just call it the Boyd. It's okay, the automatic, yeah, that's the its Boyd. name. The, the, the ring, Boyd. The ring of the Boyd. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ring of protection. Oh, that's it got me a really, really interesting one. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> How much more generic can you get in a ring of protection? Oh, come on. I can I can make it an interesting ring of protection. Go on, go, Eric. All right, go, Eric, go, go for it, bud. All right. I was thinking the other day that in Ed's, like, I look at my things and I'm constantly making amulets because I can imagine them. They're all interesting. 
But Ed's books only, they, they just have ring after ring and people are slipping these weird rings on their fingers. So I'm like, I should put more rings in the game. But that would be boring just to put rings in the game. So then I was thinking when we were talking earlier tonight about, you know, enchanted familiars and I was thinking about, you know, what to do with uh, magic pets, that kind of thing. So here's, here's my idea. Uh, you got to think of garter snakes, okay? So these are living garter snakes of magic. And when they're not being used for their thing, they are in garter snake form and they're squirmy and they're constantly trying to get away. But when you um, put them on, they turn into a ring as it wraps around your finger, you might get a ring of protection. So imagine you walk into the wizard's chamber, you're desperate to escape, he's got you trapped in there, you see a snake writhing on the floor, wrap it around your finger, all of a sudden you're invisible. But you, it, you're you literally, if you take the ring off, it's back to a snake. There's also daggers like this, where they look like a snake until you hold it by the tail and it turns into a dagger. The second you let go, it's back into snake form. So your ring of protection is one of these enchanted snakes, but there's all sorts of them. But all of them have this weird the power's always on. So you either have to have the power on or you can't, um, it can't be in uh, ring form. It's going to be back in writhing snake form. Is that interesting enough for you, George? No, that's good. But also think about yeah. that, but you can't keep it on, <laughs> but you can't keep it on or the, or the ring dies and it becomes just a ring. I like that. Uh, actually, as, as Eric was rambling about his snake idea, hey. I, was, uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually I did didn't hear thought. you. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did have a thought. Um, and items from the Saruk, the creator. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and this would have, you, you would have to be careful about balancing stuff. But I was thinking, you, you see these rings these days, um, and I think my, my wife's actually got one in there. They're rings that you wear on the one hand, but they're linked by like a chain. Right. So it's like two rings, but they're linked by a chain. And I was thinking, what if there's a situation where, and thinking of And you're Stevens, wearing the other one, George? Stevens, <laughs> Stevens Legacies to the Realm. <laughs> Something like that would be cool in the sh coming out of the Shun Empire, and it, maybe it might be a, um, an aspect of their magic uh, item creation. Um, so, you know, you see something like that, and it's, you think Shun. Um, and it's rings that are linked by those chains and ca count as one magic item if you're uh, into the attunement five fifth edition thing which i'm not i'm in the anti-attunement league i don't believe in that but anyway <laughs> um, but, uh, but um so you have these rings that are linked and have various powers when they're linked with the chains but over time and due to various things you know those rings have been separated so you might just have a ring of protection that you think is a mundane basic ring of protection but little do you know that if you bring it within close contact of another ring, this magical little chain is created and you get the benefits of both if you wear them on the one hand. And I would think you'd probably have a maximum of three, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. But it's like, uh, again, to use one of Stephen's great ideas, it's like a series magic thing where if you get all three, you know, you get various different powers, etc. cetera. Um, and so, um, you know, that's that's way to have a, a low level item, you know, a ring of protection plus one for your character. And then um, as time goes on, you can add further rings to it. And before you know it, you've got this powerful magic item for a powerful uh, high level. High level and character. at the same time, because somebody else is collecting the Staff of Waterdeep or the Rod of Seven Parts from the other end, they come looking for you to get your little bauble. That's right. It's, oh, yeah, yeah. Because maybe it's stacking pluses, you know. Yeah, and, it's, and, it, and it might have, uh, you know, unique... Mod uh, indicators on it that make you realize that you know you hear about someone else who's got your other one or, or the other one in the series etc right. and so there's don't, you've, you've got your adventure don't. idea and your quest idea so that's, it, a, that's or as you keep adding rings that they become more sentient and you have to find the other rings Ooh, i like that uh, the intelligent rings yeah there's there's, there's no reason why only only swords have um you know intelligence and sentience i think i think that it should be for every magic item and yeah. then once you link them all together, they do not come off. Yeah, they've got those little teeth, kind of like... Uh, well, yeah, what are they called? Go. Wedding rings? <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, your, your idea of the chained rings got me thinking, the only way some of the dwarves beneath Tethir and the Shun... I'm, I'm suddenly imagining, you know, they're... 
there are brass knuckles in the realms. But <laughs> if you're a dwarf, you can actually activate the magic in those. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. right. There you go. They're just, you know, uh, a very handy thing for bouncers to have if you've got sausage fingers to fit in there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, you know, those uh, like, you know, the brass knuckles kind of thing, Stephen, like where you got three or four holes through the one item yep. and you and you put them over your hand and, um, you know, it, it covers all of your 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 fingers on your fist. Mm -hmm. What if that's the magic item and it kind of you have to think about how to play balance this, but it kind of has like four ring effects that add up to a kick-ass fighter kind of thing. Uh, and maybe you can even um, like decouple them and build different ones that come together. Just as an idea. Collect them all. <laughs> <laughs> but you can only wear four at a time. They went to Voltron for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, be the head. Steve, <laughs> Steve, Stephen did something like that in, in his Corman theory book where he had, we, well, not weird, um, unique elven ones called Billuth, which kind of wrapped around and you put your fingers in them. So they weren't like hold the wand. They were like part of your hand and sort of finger holds. Carmanther where the wand holds you. So you, you cast spells <laughs> and, the, and the wand was still attached to your hand. So Yeah, I like cool. that. Yeah. Right. Kind of like Wolverine, but wands pop out. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wolver ones. Wolver ones. That's it. That's it. Since this is a PG rated thing, we won't talk about that much. No, no we won't. We won't. So, so uh, see, look at that, George. I, you're, you're. I'm remembering a uh, a weird item I put into that. Oh, I did this for Bastion Press back in ooh, 2001, and it was um, not quite. It was a magical item, but it was more alchemical or you know, plant like. And it was kind of imagine, imagine if you had a living plant for a familiar that would kind of crawl along your your arms and shoulders, and it would boost some of your magic items with certain you know plant based effects or something like that. I'd have to go dig it up and and see what that was about. But it was it was kind of strange because I ended up with things like you know you have a bramble of holly that would uh, boost your armor somehow you know things like that and it was just a very odd idea and i have no idea where it came from and i haven't used it since <laughs> well, we got time steven we'll wait for you <laughs> <laughs> let me go get my book first, first, he has to, first he has to roll up a druid and that takes a long time that's true that's true that's true and when you I were talking we had a no druid policy in the campaign no druids no gnomes no gnomes, definitely. No, no druid gnomes. <laughs> there aren't no. such things. Kender gnome. <laughs> Kender gnome. That's right. So you see, George, it turned out that 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 simple plus one ring of protection turned into a twenty minute yeah. discussion. You know, my and, my idea was pretty cool. I agree with you. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and interestingly, yeah. this was something else that got censored by TSR. I had in one of the the adventures I put in a a golem, a guardian statue, it didn't do much else, but it had tons and tons of wands for fingers. Oh, wow. And the editor, the editor said, no, 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 no. That's, that's unbalancing. And it's like, have you seen what else you've published? <laughs> <laughs> but you don't win those sort of arguments. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think I found, here's an image of, Oh, one that's enhanced by a little, uh, I, I can't remember the specific, Earl Kenna was the generic name for it. Okay. So, you know, it wraps on and it boosts uh, a typical magic item with new effects. Wow. Oh, nice. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. So is that like a, like a, a piece of ivy that kind of wraps up around a tree? It wraps around magic items and transitions them? I remember the book. Yeah. You and I used to talk a lot while you were writing that. Alchemy oh, yeah. Herbalist, yeah. And it was easier stuff to work on than anything for Sea of Fallen Stars because you always had to tweak the effects to work underwater. You know? <laughs> oh, uh, somebody said here they had any ideas for I items for a gambling, gambling addicted halfling cleric. Uh, Eric, why don't you take that one? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that that was by you can't heal stupid. That person is obviously a wild player. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> a gambling addicted half. Uh, what was the rest? Halfling cleric. Well, first you got to decide what they're a cleric of. I don't know. We'll have to ask him. Okay. Um, stupid. What cleric? <laughs> uh, uh. Let's see. If... Trickery. Trickery? <laughs> I'm just gonna say. Uh, you keep saying, "Hey, stupid! I'm talking to you." <laughs> <laughs> it says worships Tamora. Okay, there you go. Tamora. Cleric of Tamora. So it's a lot. Okay. Says. I'll worship um, her tomorrow. <laughs> oh, boo. I'll give you the money tomorrow. <laughs> that's right. That's, right. <laughs> that's too perfect. Sorry. That's, just... that's, that's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. It's a, it's a pouch. It's a pouch of a pouch where it looks like it's full of gold, but when you give it to someone else, the gold goes into the other pouch that you've got, which is a sister magic <laughs> item, which is still sitting on your belt. Yeah, you, so you go. go here. Here's your gold. Here's my payment for my gambling debts, and then run. And then run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I do think probably the thing that I would make for the ga- gambling addicted uh, no. halfling of Timora is a deck of cards. Only the symbols on them skirt about and move, and so it looks like a you know a three of clubs, but really two of the clubs are you can move with your mind and they skirt around and they make it a five of clubs. Um, while, I mean, this isn't realmsy enough. I, you'd have to do it the realms version, but to, you know, talk about human decks. Um, and then I'm going to ask Ed what uh, a, a typical realms card deck looks like. Uh, mm. But just to warn you, um, <laughs> but, very but, simple. A typical realms card deck is round. Ooh, I like it. You uh-huh. can't, you can't bend the corners of the cards to mark them. You can't cut or wear the corners of the cards. They're all circles. I There's like a it. frustrated casino owner talking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So basically, the magic item is that the with your mind you can you can cause the symbols on the cards in your hand to move. And so, if somebody's counting cards, they might figure it out. So you got to be you got to be kind of risky to use it. But if you're desperate. You can turn, you know, you can get that 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 pair or, what, or three of a kind or straight just by having the, uh, the 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 symbols move on the cards. Nice, nice. No, no, see. that's what's a what's a good name for it, uh, Eric or Ed or even George or any of you guys. Um, the <laughs> the deck of death. If they catch it. Yeah, it. that's yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say like the 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 hand of uh, Brando, sort of short for Brando Barris. I know we all said Timora, but it feels a little bit like that too to me. We call um, crooked dealers in poker mechanics, so maybe it could be like the mechanics hand of Brando. I like it. Nice. Nice. There you go. We'll put that in there. In a, an alternate version of that and oh yeah the, the gambling addicted halflings a simple ring that if you hold the the dice or knuckle bones long enough you can add or subtract pips as you need <laughs> oh <laughs> yes cards, it will shift the number of you know you you've got you've got two twos well you can change it into two fives or something like that you know mm. See, I, I was thinking a pair of gloves, which you can store a card into each of them and then swap cards using the glo- gloves. So basically, if you've got, you know, a card that you want in your glove, you just swap it out for one in your hand and boom, you get your different hand. There you so go. I, I was thinking, you know how uh, like craps players blow on the dice before they uh, do something? Uh-huh. When you blow on these dice... Um, it turns them all in all into the two numbers you're you're picking. So no matter what you roll, like if you want a pair of sevens, you'll get a pair <laughs> yeah. of sevens. Oh, wow. oh wow, blowjob dice. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the dice of Ed. Drawing on you, you get hit later when the DM wills it. <laughs> to, <laughs> the end of... Well, they're kind of flawed though, because if you pick them up and look, you'll realize like. 
they're either like all twos or all, all six sides of the dice are the same. Yeah. So you have to kind of, cause you don't know which ones are going to come up. So like you blow on them and you think the number, but then all six sides are that number. So if somebody notices it, you're, mm. um, Dude. Uh, so dude. there's a percent chance of getting busted. You'd have to oh, calculate yes. that into the, yes. the stats. Yeah, because they're they're addicted, so it has to have that chance. Yeah, a yep. spell fail chance or something of that effect. And, and then there was the halfling gambler Imbla, the imbecile, who asked for a pair of sevens and uh, got found out pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's Brando. <laughs> well, worse than that was the one who asked for a new pair of shoes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Oh, my God. Okay. Um, so <laughs> that's like a really great turn. I love that. Anybody else? Have any, any questions from the audience out there, guys, the watchers? Please let us, you know. Um, We're here all uh, week. That's right. <laughs> If the uh, gallery comes up with something, I'll absolutely read it. But Jeff, I'd like to know one about one of uh, your creations, whether it's something you came up with or you got oh. from a different source. I'm interested okay. to know the stats on it. There was a wishing well, which I used against you, and it was actually it ended up being in my favor. Yeah. <laughs> did you concoct that wishing well yourself, and how did you generate what you did for all the other players? I know how it turned out for me. How did it turn out? Was it, you have to remind me. I'm not. Uh, it's a. It's too long of a conversation. Um, <laughs> now we're interested. It, yeah. 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 No. Go ahead. Tell me. <laughs> well, tell 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 me what you did to generate the effect of the wishing well when when we discovered that it was a wishing well. How did you generate the the outcomes? Was it just you rolled and you came up with something, or is it at random, or were you working off of a design that you pulled from a book somewhere? No, that was totally random. Totally random. So you, <laughs> so you made stuff up. Nobody right. ever does that in the realms. Nobody ever does that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened to you? I don't remember. I don't. I, I remember uh, the wishing well, but then, I remember okay. what happened. I'm going to apologize for this story in advance. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I was taking advantage because I knew that I could. I knew that Jeff had not read any of the books that I was reading at all. And so the guys figure out that this is a wishing well. They start wishing for stuff and things and items. And, you know, Jeff's like, yeah, yeah, it's okay, 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 okay. And, and they got some really good stuff. Um, I pulled a fast one on Jeff. And I said to <laughs> the wishing well, to so you know. <laughs> I, I said to the wishing well, I said, I wish to speak with the ghost of Zach Nefane Dorden. And Jeff has no idea who this person is. I, I'd never read the books yet. <laughs> At read all. Yet. Zero. Zero. And I just wanted to see what he would do with this information because he was watching me unfold my utter fascination with Drow and my love affair with uh, – I remember the, the now. I Keep talking. Let's see. I remember this now. Yep. And um, – and it was a conversation we had to have with Bob later because I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> we sat and we talked for, for a few minutes, and, and Jeff was just kind of completely role-playing and free-forming with me as I, as I was uh, talking to this apparition of Zach Nefane. <laughs> and the final question that I got to ask – yeah, shame on me for sure, That's bro. right, That's Brian. absolutely true. Um, <laughs> I took advantage. I really did because <laughs> I wanted to see what he would say. I wanted to see what he would say. So, and, and Jeff was letting me know out of character, Hey, you're, you're the, the connection is fading. It's it's, you're probably going to need to ask one more question. So uh, the last question I asked Zach Nefane was a real zinger. I said, who are you to me? And I left it completely out there. What was the answer, Jeff? Uh, Jeff has no has no idea who this person is at all. I said he was your grandfather. Yeah. Oh. So uh, Jeff just kind of writes my character into the Dorden storyline. That's why you guys. So, 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 I am your father. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, we had our Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker moment at the wishing well, well and I it was completely impromptu. I, I I wanted to see what he would say, and was not expecting anything like that at all. And I was just like. Wow. Well, what it turned out to, then, and then, we, <laughs> then I came up with the story behind it was that wasn't she a slave girl? 
for the family, and he decided to take advantage of her, but then had the feelings for back, her. The backstory was on a raiding party to the surface. They had brought back um, some moon elves, and right. um, Zach Nefane used to openly just pick on this one particular female moon elf. Just was cruel and terrible to her in front of everybody, but it was all complete ruse. Uh, to keep everybody off the mark because he really was into her. And they secretly had a love affair and had, had fallen for each other. And that's how my part of the lineage began down the line. Um, but then she got pregnant. <laughs> she got she got pregnant and Zach Nefane, uh true to uh, his genetics, was all about trying to get uh, the ones he cared about out of here. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, he found a way to get the um, the Moon Elf Maiden uh, back to the surface and in the safekeeping. And actually, how we played it in the campaign, this was um, during the time when we were crossing over from Greyhawk and then melding everything into the Forgotten Realms. How the story was written is that she was taken to the realms and then sent to Greyhawk. Uh, so she'd be completely away from anybody looking uh, to find her where she came and from. And he would never see her again also. Correct. So that my, my lineage started as the character that I was playing in Greyhawk when we were converting at the time from Greyhawk into the Forgotten Realms. And that's how that story with my character's nice. back end was written. And then when I, was brought, nice. when I was brought back to the realms, my name changed. My class was a little bit different. My my heritage was... was uh, I was no longer... Uh, the type of elf I was in in uh, Greyhawk yeah. anymore. I was now a half drow, half moon elf, and I was before an that elf. you were a valley elf. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> and, and I was I was at Elminster's Tower with the worst amnesia. So for a, a good part of our campaign, I didn't even know who I was. So That's right. Jeff was still uh, figuring out how we we're going to make this work because this was his first jump into. The Forgotten Realms, and he was basically doing the home, doing homework while we were live playing everything, trying to get everything realmsy in as he could, because we were all Greyhawk forever. And then when I read the, when I read Bob's book, I went, "That's Zach <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. No, nice. That was, that was very that was, nice. That was nice. That so, was so nice. I actually have a question for Ed, inspired by um, Curry, Thanks. or rather behind Curry. And George uh, had another question too. Oh, so. I should let George That's go first. No, 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 no. You first, and then then we'll get to George's question. And this is a little bit bringing Greyhawk into the realm, so um, yeah. th this doesn't have to be a canon answer. But everybody always loved that first edition player's handbook cover. Yeah. So if you were going to put that scene in the realms, where and when would it be? Hmm. Well, that is Moloch. It could be. Yeah, I mean, but but I mean, that's what eventually the yeah. TSR guys decided that that idol was. was but I, don't don't constrain yourself to that. It could be anything. Mm. So I would say, just looking at that original player's handbook cover and looking at that temple, that's um, warmer realms. So it's like Kalamshan, that um, uh, latitude. Okay. okay? It doesn't have to be Kalimshan, but it's somewhere it's that along band. that band of latitude, somewhere. So <laughs> I would I would either put it way out east in, in Murgum and Semfar and so on, where there's temples, or I'd put it in Kalimshan, and I'd have um, somebody robbing a temple there. Because that's also a place in which they would construct things and put giant gems, waste them <laughs> as the eyes. Yeah. Um, many of the colder kingdoms the they would either um uh a, a giant a gem that big that wasn't flawed if it was flawed it would be broken down and recut into dozens or scores or even hundreds of small gems that could be used as currency or worn yeah. far more useful um if it was unflawed it would inevitably end up in the hands of a ruler or a ruling court and it would be inevitably handed to a magic user of some sort to use as a magic <coughs> item, become a magic item. 
the living gem. Not anyone. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it would be something like that. So to me, that says um, Kalim Shen or uh, the Lands of the Lion or something at that um, latitude. And, it, and, it, and is it a god or is it a, a fake god or is it, a, is it Moloch or some devil? Or I'd say they're using uh, Moloch as the model for their idol. And I'd say it's one of those crooked cults. Um, so it's sort of like, um, not to bring the real world into this, how some political parties raise money <laughs> for one cause when they're actually using it for another. So what you're doing is you're you're using the gullible to make offerings mm -hmm. um, for small luck, small daily luck. Please uh, help my, my business succeed in, in this 10-day because I desperately need new shoes for the baby or whatever, you know? So yeah. if it's a small ask, the cult might actually make that happen by sending customers in the city to that guy's business. So he has a good 10 day, he has a good run, but they take his money. So they're taking small amounts of money from everybody. And they're saying that the, the God is looking after them and they're really pocketing it mm. and like living it. off of it. It might be perfect. They never looked at that cover and thought that's a bugbear guy because it really looks like Dave Sutherland's bugbear. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, if if I had to play with that, I would go with um, Mammon instead of Moloch. Yeah. Okay. Because Mammon, yeah. because Mammon's got um, a snake body, and there's they've they've killed a bunch of lizard men. So I'd be thinking. Um, an offshoot okay. cult of cult of the Wanty with lizardmen servants, maybe in the Orsaran Mountains oh, near nice. Flondes, oh. and uh, they've moved away from the the standard Wanty snake gods, and they're worshiping, you know, an archdevil yeah. of the of hell. Because yeah. on the on the side of that scene, there is a dead scaled thing being dragged away. Yeah, yeah. behind so, Curry, behind Curry there. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, you can't really see what it is because I, of. Because well, there's the, another one. If Carrie moves the other way, there's another one on the altar. <laughs> Very dead on the altar yeah. where they've yeah. chopped them up Chilling, a couple. Yeah. So there is there is that. that city right where you're talking about that's in the band that I was talking about. I think it's Cirque. It's a lizard yeah. man city of yep. some sort. So it could certainly yep. have been there. Yep. Yeah, that's like close that. by. So yep. it's like a, a a nine hills cult uh, in the lizard men of Cirque. Did, did, like did, did, did Trampier have any idea what who it was when he was painting it, or just they just said paint something? You know, I think he was just free forming, but it would have had to be approved, right? Like Gary, get, nothing went on the covers of the early books that Gary didn't like, mm. and in the later books that Frank Mentzer also didn't like. But okay. but yeah, I would say he probably just did his thing, and they said, "Hey, that's cool." Now, here's and, they, and then, and I think they probably used the prototype of marketing. Now, and I have right. to say prototype because TSR never had to do marketing, and they were very bad at it because the game went from nothing to selling itself. Yeah, you know, yeah, it went cool. it went from Gary um, giving uh, <coughs> slabs or two fours to us Canadians a beer to Pete. So Pete's freight when he was driving to um, the airport in Milwaukee would stash a box of D&D &D stuff to be shipped out under his seat, the driver's seat, you know, as an extra thing. Uh, it, it went from that to, I have to hire people, I have to hire all my family, because that's what we do, because they all need jobs, because we can't keep up with this, because this is growing like wildfire, so they didn't have to marketing. But I think the one prototype of marketing they did is they probably took that image and held it up 10 feet away, looked at the idol and said, wow, you can see that from 10 feet away. Look right. at it. Look how right. striking it is. And then they probably walked down to the back of the room as far away as they could get in their house and held it up and said, yeah, I could spot that in the middle of a bunch of other books in the shop. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the, the other thing, though, the other thing, though, is that the, the layout of that picture is clearly a book cover picture because right. that column is a spine for the book. So yeah. You've got a back cover and a front cover. So it clearly, I, I suspect he was told we need a cover for a book. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's the way he came up with that setup. But I, I, I agree with that. I think he just riffed on whatever he thought was cool. 
the other thing I think what was actually brilliant about that cover was that um, like that image alone, if, if you're just thinking about Dungeons and Dragons as a game, like you look at that image, you go, yeah, I might actually go in a dungeon to get those gems. Yeah. You know, I it mean, says it, all. It, it does. It kind of mm -hmm. says it's actually worth it to go kill the monsters to steal the stuff. Right. I mean, exactly. there's a little bit more to D&D than that, but, you know, <laughs> no, but, no, but essentially that's, that's it. But Ed, I want you to tell for the people who are listening and everybody, if nobody here has heard, I know you probably have. What happened with that painting? That original from 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 David, Dave Trampier, remember? I remember a story. It was stuck in storage. They they talked about that painting in that uh, Art and Arcana documentary last year. Yeah, but but did they talk about what that it was being thrown out? Yeah. Okay, I couldn't remember if they did or not. Okay. That was among among them, I think. And so, but yeah, by then Trampy had disappeared, and you know it was years before anybody found him as a cabbie. And right, right. I don't remember where? Uh, yeah, just south um, across the border in Illinois. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, they were, in the case of people know they were going to throw that painting away, the original. Yep. Was stuck mm. behind a dumpster to be thrown away, and you know found it. when when the TSR offices were um, closing down right after Gen Con when they were shipping stuff to to Renton, uh, there was a ton of stuff hitting the dumpster, and wow. um, uh, Wes Nicholson, who was then an RPGA regional manager from Australia, and he was in tears literally because a lot of the stuff in the game library that was being left behind. You see, the TSR guys grabbed everything they wanted from the game library and put it on a skid in the middle of the library and wrapped all that that shipping material around it. Everything on the skid goes with us. Everything else just gets left behind. And eventually, I, I, I heard later, the uh, a third party crew who was brought in to clean out the building, the new people who were gonna use that building didn't like the glass block windows at the back anyway so they just smashed them out with a hammer put a, a garbage scow on the ground outside and just threw everything from the game library into the garbage scow mm. until it was full and then brought another one anyway um everything that wasn't going to renton was just still left on the shelves in the library and uh i think it was bruce heard somebody anyway said to wes you can have all this stuff if you can get it out of here but you got to get it out of here you know right and, and he'd run out of American money. He was running down to the post office to mail it back to Australia because a lot of this stuff had never, ever reached Australia. And the import duties were non-existent at that time. So oh. all, he, all he had to do was pay for the shipping. And he'd run out of money. And he was, like, in tears. So I, I said, well, Wes, you know, I, I'm carrying, like, $3,000 American because I pay for everything in cash here. Mm -hmm. And, and handed him about four or five hundred bucks. And he was like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because otherwise it was that or the dumpster. Now, there was weird stuff in there. There were like uh, Spellfire cards in Czechoslovakian and stuff. Oh, wow. And a box, original D&D &D box sets from the, the, five, the five boxes, the Immortals and all that stuff, mm -hmm. um, in French, in German, in Hungarian, you know, that, that they'd received copies of from licensors. Um, which they just left. Mm. And then over on the other side of the cubicle land, on that, that blank wall near the head of the stairs, they just piled up all the old computers and the floppy disks, and they all went into the dumpster. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's such the a stuff shame. that I still see before TSR broke up, got bought, and all that, there was the original games library had all of the original reference of amazing stories bound up going back mm. decades. Oh, yeah. And I have yeah. no idea what happened to that, but we found out almost too late that Lorraine had just decided to get rid of it all yep. and let some librarians or whomever come in. And only, I think, Steve Winter and Thomas Reed were the ones that saved uh, maybe a third of the reference stuff we'd built up. And it was just, you know, for Boot Hill, they had that full set of time life, uh, you know, history of, of the Old West and various and sundry other stuff. It was it was all solid reference and good stuff. But yeah, the fact that 
you know, people would look at it and just say, well, it means nothing to me, so we may as well just throw it out. And it just blew yeah. up the amount of waste. Somewhere. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. That is incredible. You see, I was just visiting TSR on my annual visit. And this, these annual visits are thanks to Canadian customs laws. <laughs> um, if you were out of Canada for anything less than a week, your customs limit was at that time ridiculously low. I think it was 25 bucks that you could import without paying duty. And the favorite do uh, dodge trick of the customs men was to say, so did you gas up with your, you'd say, yeah, okay, there's your 25 bucks. So you had to pay duty on everything in the car. But if you were there for more than a week and you couldn't count the day you left Canada to go into the United States, if you were there for a week, you could uh, import 200 bucks or 250 bucks or something, which was enough for me to buy a lot of games at Gen Con and magazines and stuff. Stuff was pretty cheap back then, relatively, and bring it back into the country without paying duty. So I would stay for eight days. So I would visit TSR a few days before. I would volunteer work Gen Con. I would hang around for a few days after when management, who were just so wiped out by meeting gamers for a couple of days, would all book off. And all <laughs> of the staffers would come in and tell Gen Con stories. Uh, for a couple of days of what had happened at that Gen Con. And, and you see, I didn't know that they weren't coming back to the building because I wasn't a staffer. Nobody told me. Yeah. So the day after, I come back and the building's locked and it's deserted. <laughs> but the loading dock, the doors on the loading dock at the front consist of dirty pieces of mylar that hang down. <laughs> so if you can jump four feet, up on from the concrete to the loading dock, you can get into the building. So I went into the building and I'm just, I went to the elevator and went upstairs and started walking across and the building had been retrofitted. This is part of Lorraine's save money thing. The lights came on wherever you walked and went off behind you automatically instead of light switches. And I can tell the great washroom story later if you want. Yeah. Um, because of that. <laughs> but I walked through the building looking for people. Where is everybody? And there was one light on in cubicle land, just one, in Steve's cube. <laughs> and the reason for that was he'd received his latest comp copies of the comics from the comic company. Uh, <laughs> and the messenger had left it on the seat in his cubicle for him to find the seat he'd sit on to get down at the computer. You can't miss it. You'll sit on it. And he turned his light on, just his over desk light. So I went straight to his desk and I thought, oh, well, somebody must be here because the light's on. <laughs> and at that point, somebody, and it wasn't Pete Renner and it wasn't the other guy, the Benedictine monk, somebody who was pushing a broom said, Hi, who are you? And I said, yeah, I just, where is everybody? He says, well, they're all packing to go to the West Coast. And I said, oh. <laughs> and, and then I said, okay. And I picked up Steve's comics. <laughs> and I went out the back door. And I drove to his house at Clover and Pleasant. Mm. And said, hey, your comics. Because <laughs> he was <laughs> surrounded by boxes as he was packing to go. But... <laughs> And that, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that, that leads to the, the, the famous story. Upstairs, off cubicle land, there was a man's and a woman's washroom. And this was the famous washroom that uh, Karen couldn't reach because of the map of Waterdeep. Yeah. <laughs> when she needed to pee, okay? That's right. Well, for the, for the men's, you go in. It's a simple little room. Looks like a school washroom, cinder block with a, a mirror and a sink on one wall, and then a single stall across the back of the room with a door at the left-hand end. And you go in, and there's one toilet, no urinal. Or maybe the urinal was outside. I can't remember. Anyway, there's a, there's a toilet at the back, and there's Buck Rogers games stacked about eight high on the toilet tank. 
<laughs> and, and that was because the moment you sat down on the stall, on the seat, the lights went out. <laughs> and it, and it, was, it was pitch dark in that room. Because the door was airtight. Uh, yeah. It's sealed. It was pitch dark. And the way to make the lights came on, come on no. is when you were finished your business, you reached behind you while sitting on the toilet, grabbed <laughs> whatever would, and threw it at the ceiling. <laughs> and the motion to sensors would bring the lights uh, back on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crazy. Oh, uh, my God. Leader of the industry in gaming. In gaming. <laughs> Really, and you're throwing games at the light in the bathroom to turn it on. Oh my God! Yeah, I can remember the day the transformer <laughs> flew outside, and we lost all of the lights. And that's when we realized what a lousy workplace it was because the only people that had windows oh. in the TSR building were the the bosses, the downstairs people. We yep. were in the part that was the converted Q-tip factory. So it's all cinder blocks and it's pitch black. Yeah. The only way we all got out safely is when Steve Winter and there was one other person that happened to have a battery operated lightsaber to lead us out and out of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and the Q-tip factory had a, a ceiling of honeycomb concrete, you know, where the with ridges and then and there was a seam just at the west end of cubicle land near the entrance to jeff's cube and across from it on a diagonal the entrance to the games library which was in the corner and the two pieces of the roof did not meet up there <laughs> they were like four inches out of kilter and i i once pointed at it and said to jeff earthquake he said no Modern American construction. <laughs> Precision. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, guys, remember the 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 magic. So items? we're talking about magic items. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in the dungeon. <laughs> All, right. All right. So, and Eric, you get to go again. Uh, no, George had a George, oh, George had a question. Had a question. No, my other, my my simple question was that. Even at, we dealt with that quail's feather tokens bizarre the bizarre uh, article, which was just a whole bunch of great feather tokens, but no realms law whatsoever. And so it made me wonder how many if if any of those that work had realms law and it got stripped out by the editors to save space, and how many articles over the years of yours did they do that to in terms of what was published or what was submitted? Oh, everything got edited. And by the way, um, with the exception of Spellfire, the novel, um, which was a title that Jim Ward loved so much, they stole it for a card game right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, except for the the that one title, one of the ways, that, one of the things that editors did was title everything. It didn't matter what you called your article; they came up with a better title, better in quotation marks usually, goofier title. From the city of brass to dead orc pass you know um i didn't mind that one I thought yeah that yeah but i mean <laughs> anyway um but i mean uh they edited everything uh, sometimes heavily um sometimes it needed it because i have always been a, a man of digressions um and but you see that's <laughs> half the fun <laughs> That makes it sound like we're we're really good at this. <laughs> I am a man of discretions. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, um, yeah. So they did edit. Um, at the beginning, they did edit a lot of stuff out, and then they let. Then as the editorship changed, and and they started moving away from Greyhawk, they left more in. Like, usually, it, it, I can mark it from about the time where Kim took over the editing. Jake was still editor. Kim was his assistant, but Kim was at doing the line editing for all the articles. He left it all in because he thought, no, well, this guy's using an unreliable narrator. It's okay if he uses his own campaign world stuff because it, it, it reads better and it gives DMs wiggle room, which is why I did it. You know, it's instead of me as omniscient narrator saying, um, there are eight orcs in room three, and they've got these many hit points. 
I can have somebody like Elminster says, it's rumored that there are orcs in those ruins, but I don't give credence to it myself. And being as every player and every dungeon master at Red Dragon in those days, and they were all rules lawyers, and they all remembered what they read. <laughs> so if you tried to use it on them as a dungeon master at the gaming table, they'd say, no, nope, there are eight orcs. I know what's happening here. Uh, so you just built in the wiggle room. And Kim appreciated that, so he left it in, which is why Jeff who's one of the few designers on staff who actually read Dragon, although we found out very early on that Gary read Dragon. He read it cover to cover because <laughs> he wanted to make sure that nothing that he didn't like was, you know. Um, <laughs> and he used to write letters to the editor. Like, like articles about firearms. Yeah. No, oh. no, no. That was that was an editorial assignment, actually. He, yeah, you yeah, didn't like he, didn't, it, he didn't like your article. <laughs> no, he didn't like it at all. But, but Kim had assigned that to me. Because he's, Kim said, you can probably soft pedal this because he'd been receiving tons of firearms articles from all sorts of young Americans who were fresh out of the service. And they wanted, you know, Tommy guns that did this. And it was like, no, please, no. They didn't <laughs> no. want to put gangbusters. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, they would edit some stuff out. But then, then Kim said, OK, let's leave it in. And Jeff, who read every issue of Dragon, said, hey, maybe this guy has a, a world. Maybe he isn't just making it up as he goes along. So he made the phone call after he'd come up with the position paper. You know, let's have an official uh, a unified game world for the second edition of the game. And of course, he preceded the second edition being ready. But that's what it was for. And he, he basically said, you know, we've spent all the company's resources and two years, everybody got sucked into working on this to create Dragonlance. Won't it be easier to just buy one from somebody and hit the ground running? And of course, that's really what I in 1987 up through 1999, I was doing like almost almost a dozen products a year. And it was in order to get the game line out there. So after the first thing hit, it was like, okay, we'll let the first thing hit. Okay, it's sold. Son of a bitch. It's sold. Let's put them all out. <laughs> because they wanted they wanted you guys as gamers to think there's going to be a steady stream of stuff they're not it's not going to be one and done or it's not going to be like a small gaming company that struggles to put out a product every three years while you wait for it it's going to be a setting where we have stuff for you every month and then we train you into there'll be novels there'll be adventures it'll be constant stream and of course uh, there's a point at which you go uh, <clears throat> they're all coming out of the same wallets fellas but <laughs> but at the beginning they would just wanted where they could bring out a lot of stuff in a hurry to give you a proper world. So the, the fast thing to hit the ground running is to buy one. And when I started sending the packages, which I have recently unearthed in order to do some photocopying for gentlemen. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the males will eventually. Uh, anyway. Um, uh, but... Jeff said, holy crap, how much stuff do you have? And I said, oh, lots more. So there was a point at which, at the end of the first year, we said, okay, stop sending stuff. Stop! <laughs> Please stop! <laughs> but, but, but because they, by then, they figured they had enough for eight or nine products. Like FR4, the Magister, that's all my magic items. What Steve Perrin did was put the tables in and write that little thing at the end and input it. And just grab stuff out of your dragon articles, which was yeah. easy. Just yeah. Transpose it over. Yeah. And you created some new stuff. So, mm. yeah. And, and all the stuff, like, like the stuff, right? The, the illustration that's behind Eric right now from FR5 Savage Frontier. Um, Paul did the Eric the Alchemist stuff and the, the story through. But that was all stuff that got chopped out of FR1 Waterdeep in the north because they didn't think Waterdeep was as big as it was. <laughs> and I said to them, 64 pages? This is going to be the American Automobile Association <coughs> guide to the north. What, no, because you're like, you're like, Waterdeep's the size of the United States. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, of course, when, when Jeff taped the whole map together, that got a city system. Yeah. 
because yeah. the TSR exec came around the corner and, and Jeff said, don't walk on this. You know, the same time as Karen was saying, I have to pee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he says, what is this? He says, it's a city. And the guy looked down and said, oh, this has got to be a product. <laughs> and because of that, you got product out of it. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. That is so anyway. cool. Anyway. Eric, sorry, um, Ed, did you find that spells and magic items were a really good way to segue into, you know, writing for the game and, and that sort of stuff? Sure, because they set up all your lore and they add the wonder and mystery and awe that we always should have had around the gods, but never got because everybody wanted to have avatars on stage and so on. And at the same time, because of the code of conduct, they yeah. wanted to downpedal what clerics did be, besides heal. So they certainly didn't want to have prayers and stuff for each faith printed <laughs> because they didn't want teenage mothers from heck. Oh, yeah. To be <laughs> angry imagine. to say satanic panic yeah. when they're when they walk into a room and their little kids are going, oh, yo, 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 <laughs> and saying it's something from the game. Um, so they didn't want that stuff published at all. So it took years before uh, Eric down there and Julia were able to actually publish details, any details of the faiths. You see, what I originally had um, and wanted to have prominent was, okay, here's a one sheet for a cleric of every faith. Here's your do's and don'ts. Here's your day. Here's how you pray. These are the colors. Here are the weird rules, like don't kick cats or eat cats or whatever it is. You know, um, <laughs> um, as long as it's cat-based. <laughs> no, but Apparently. I mean, a thing for every faith. And they just didn't want to publish any of that stuff. The problem with doing it that way is you take away the aura of awe and mystery from the gods. And the one place you can leave it is in magic, which is why I also wanted to overwhelm people with too many different monsters that look alike, so you couldn't just memorize the two in the player in the monster manual. Oh, it's either a beholder or it's a <laughs> a gas spore. So throw something at it from long range, and if it doesn't blow up, run like hell. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, you had to get away from that by publishing tons and tons of extra monsters, and you had to beef up magic by having tons and tons of variant spells that various people had worked on various wizards and they had their own version so it's it's uh material components were different or it didn't need any material components or it didn't need uh, a verbal or somatic com component or whatever so you have the guy tied up and you're you're about to go and beat the crap out of him to get him to tell him tell you where all his magic is and he unleashes a spell on you and you well he can't do that oh you think he's just following what's in the player's handbook that you've memorized with your metagaming at the table knowledge. <laughs> oh, no. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so you would keep the magic ore and stuff. You would keep all that in the magic items and in the spells. And at the same time, you would drop all these hints of people who'd had careers so that there were heroes walk the earth before the player characters. What a novel concept. And you, you would drop a... Um, uh, the names of vanished kingdoms and cities. And so he said, where's that? Well, they've got to have more magic there. Let's go on a quest for it. And half the time it didn't exist anymore. Or was it ruined or was lost? Or Jeff would phone you at the library and say, hey, tell me more about the Zerta place. Can we put a dungeon there? <laughs> you have one? Hint, hint. Intent. We have a new person joining us here. Yeah. Yay. He's practicing hey, safe zooming. Look at him. <laughs> so that's how Ryan. all of that happened. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. Hey, how Hi. you doing, Brian? How are you doing? doing? I have to Our magic up. items aren't that bad, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is just a general safe practice. I'll take that off in a second. That was, of course, just a joke. I know, no, it was good. It was good. I like it. Please let me know if I'm not speaking loudly enough, but I'm trying not to wake my children because then I'll have to go right away. So no, no worries. Okay. No worries. Understood. No worries. Uh, before we get to anything on Brian Curry, you want to read that in the in the chat? You're talking to Do Wadu. Okay, so 
Do I do is uh, talking about a good aligned divine item that indoctrinates and corrupts you into another faith. Um, I had asked uh, that would imply sentience, yes, and their response was um, it was more thinking of light urges or compulsions that affect the personality of the owner rather than intelligence and sentience. And I said, well, perhaps maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more because the wording of indoctrination would imply some type of intelligence or personality that would have to, uh, indoctrination comes with a certain type of heavy persona style influence. Um, so maybe start off of uh, those bones and see where we can take it gentlemen so um i love heresies <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> um, i love reimagining how faiths work and so the idea of encouraging players to explore differences in faith are uh quite fun in my mind um when ed and i wrote power of frey rune we of course uh uh talked about one example of heresy which apparently people thought was true uh about a monitor coming back so you know that kind of heresy i could see um i get one question a role. week still sorry <laughs> <laughs> people out on the internet says okay are they one god are they really one god and so or it worked on both fourth and fifth edition no, there are five I cannot, lives that I cannot tell you one <laughs> how much work that created. <laughs> it created a ton so, of work. Oh my god! So what? So the it's idea I had three-sided to... pyramid. What's wrong with you, people? No, <laughs> it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> we have to argue <laughs> like theologians around a table. Lysander is a glove, <laughs> and the hand in the glove is my. <laughs> 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 So the item I was thinking of is not a rubber glove, but we could go that way. <laughs> no. And we And we What I was thinking is like a crystal pyramid that glows with light, but it doesn't ever stop. And so <laughs> it's making me laugh, sorry. Um, it doesn't ever stop. And so, you know, the Lathanderites are supposed to be about dawn, right? And the, right. And the transformation, right. the change. And this would fix you on the light and not let you think about the change, but the eternalness of the sun and the light. Mm. And so it doesn't even have to talk to you or be sentient, but it does have, to, it does draw you in and that light sort of tracks you like a moth to a flame, literally, and you can't walk away. And it sort of drags you into the heresy, whether you want to or not. Something mm. along those lines would probably be reasonable. You could also, I think, do something George and I had to play with. Um, what I love Roger Moore's original articles on the racial deities. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's challenging about the way he chose to do it was you know, the elven gods are all chaotic good, or at least they the original sub five or six were all chaotic good. And the dwarven gods were lawful good. And, you know, there wasn't, mm. it's very hard if you want to have like an evil elf house of gold elves, which, you know, Stephen gave us lots of, um, and they have a cleric. Well, who the heck do they worship? And so uh, George and Just I- Just lie a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> George and I had a play that you could come up with an alternate pantheon that was- you know, involved maybe Zugtamoy and Moander and, you know, a couple others like that. But so my thought was another item that would allow, that would draw you into a heresy <laughs> is a vine, a vine that like while you're sleeping one night, it crawls up and wraps around your leg and it won't let go and you can't really tear it off and it digs itself into your skin mm. and ties itself into your blood system. And it, it makes you think about the, the plants and what they're doing and what they're thinking constantly. And so it would draw you further and further in. And the more you think about it, the darker the plant would get as it drank more of your blood. And fertile eventually... lies, fertile lies. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually you're worshiping Moander. Exactly. So there's two of them for you. So um, uh, do I do in the chat says that uh, the item they're suggesting is inspired by Testament of Jade from Attack on Myth Draner, a book but its abilities turned up to a max, something that can easily be abused. A good aligned villain is so much fun to play with. 
I agree with that, but I think there's a difference between a villain that's actually good and a villain that is um, convinced that they're doing good. Right. You want to make sure to to mm-hmm. make that distinction because mm. one can be convinced that lots lots of great villains are convinced that what they're doing is sure best for the kingdom. Trickle down people. economics, anyone? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. Well, those yeah, villains that's, are usually that's, that's sincere. Yeah, right, right. Trickle down economics is a sincere it, belief. But those villains who think they're doing good are usually crazy too. Not always. Not, Not always. always. You don't think so? I think you can have a. Well, Thanos wasn't crazy, and he he thought he was doing the right thing. He was. He was... Yeah. Well, yeah, he was a psycho. Yeah, well, he was if a psycho you man. people, <laughs> if you wouldn't, people wouldn't breed like rabbits. You'd stay within the planet's supplies of food. And... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I have to admit, one thought I had in regards to a, you know, an art, uh, an item that would lure people away from their faith. I'm suddenly thinking of the the clergy of Lyra, the 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 goddess of lies. Mm-hmm. I would think that her church probably made some. A lot of items that looked a lot like items of other churches mm. that would lend power. They they would give power the way that you would expect it, but there would be a hidden power that if you just strayed a tiny bit off the path of your God's teachings, you got a real big boost. Right. And that was a great way for them to undermine other faiths is to pretty much just slowly bleed away the faithful by corruption. Right. I actually like that. That's and I can't remember I what like I did with Lyra. Is she, is she back? Is she... Or did they... She, just she never died. Well, but, that's what she says. That's what she that's says. Just ask her. All right. gods are back. <laughs> but all gods are back now. Yeah, okay. Except Moander. Except for Moander, yeah. yeah. No, we like, no, Moander's back. He's always back. I never die. <laughs> okay, sorry. I never um, die. Brian, the <laughs> same, same uh, as from Ed singing. <laughs> <laughs> What's an item you would like to see? Would you, you want us to draw you, just roll you up on one randomly, or you want to throw one out there for everybody to kick around? So before before we do any of this, I mean, I, I heard you guys speaking earlier. I had my my I had John Mobile and was listening to some of the conversations, and I, I tend to be on George's side that the the story is supremely important. But for me, I think as a dungeon master, it's just as important as the story that creates the item is the story that you intend to tell with the item in your game. You know, introducing an item that has tremendous lore potential, but your players aren't interested in pursuing is it's it's a history book that nobody's going to read. Right. And as as I mean, I know I know full well who's on this call. So <laughs> <laughs> I know I know who would read those stories and who Absolutely. would enjoy them. But I think you know, um, as as interesting as the power and the history of a given item might be, what what storytelling potential does that item bring to your table? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to the story that you're tell- already telling. What doors does it open? What doors does it close? Right. Well, if it's if it's the crown of twin flames, that number is zero. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely zero. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, I want to I want to give an example. So you know, for, it, it, as everybody on the call knows, I, I tinker around with the royal lineage of Cormier all the time. And in fourth <laughs> edition, they introduced um, these pouches that, that came in a set of two, and they were they were rather than being like a bag of holding you would put something in one pouch and close it and it would appear in the, in the opposite pouch, right? So it was like a teleportation wallet. And I wrote into the lineage that that was how they initially discovered the potential of the crystal grot. That that was that one of the Obarskiers who discovered it um, would use the pouch, one of the pouches to transmit, transmit the, the, the sapphires from the crystal grot to the other one. Um, Rather than having to find the narrow passage out with arms arm full of gems and get waylaid along the road, right? Um, that was their secure means of transporting it. So, 
the game had introduced an item that we were able to weave into the existing story of the world. Um, that's what I like to do. Rather than coming up with random, random items and, and figuring out a story, though I'm happy to do it, since that seems to be the theme for the evening. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, <I think> it's... <laughs> well, the whole idea was to have fun with it, but and if something came out that was lore-worthy, it would be great. I mean, Eric's already... And you probably heard some of those things he was coming up with. It's like, my yeah. God, man, do you ever sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he, I'm sure he, I, I mean, I missed part of it. I'm sure he pulled out the, the table of war cords so he could figure out which one it had Actually, been created to fight and which one it had been stolen by and which one it was recovered. Thanks on. for awakening the suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, we've now named all of them. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Because there's still the nameless horde. Uh -huh. That's right. <laughs> that sounds like a name. You it see, does, it does. It does, doesn't we, it? We, we, but, ran, we officially ran out of cool names. The last yeah, one I but... came up with was the horde unending. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but now, whenever something goes missing... Like, you know, one of your socks. Who took it? The Nameless, nameless Horde. <laughs> it's like calling Finder the Nameless Bard. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Giving him a different name. That's right. That's right. But so, yeah, roll if we want to roll. Okay, want, let's get a roll in here. All right, give let's me a see. roll. Let's see what kind of item it is. You can have a I got a 45. 45. Ooh, it's a wand. I haven't had wand. There we go. I haven't had wands yet. Now, do you want to come up with a wand? Or do you want us to roll again? Let me let me let me throw in a, a a wrinkle just to make sure it's easy for Brian. You are not. <laughs> <laughs> you are not constrained by third edition rules. You can follow Ed style first and second edition wands to your heart's content. Mm. There you go. Okay, so do you want us to roll for a uh, tip for a wand for a power, or you want to come up with it yourself? Give me a moment. I'm not. I'm not the best on the fly, so I'm gonna that's okay. No, take um, your time. We, we believe, believe in it's you, Eric, but it's okay. Hey, I can hear you, George. <laughs> it's called the internet, <laughs> <laughs> and it's out there forever. Did someone mute him? <laughs> hey, now we can just throw insults across across the continents. I mean, <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, say to um, you, come here and say this to me. <laughs> the wand of the wand of trusses. Oh, there you go. No. <laughs> As with George, I am I am also part of the um, anti attunement league. Yes. Um, I find that the idea of attunement is has been overused in fifth edition. I mm -hmm. think the idea that um, an item that doesn't directly affect the wielder shouldn't require attunement yep. doesn't make sense unless it's somehow tied into your being and you've you've uh, magically uh, connected with it, or it's an item that is truly yours. I'm thinking of items like Aegis Fang or the Black Staff, you know, that mm. are, that no matter who might be holding it, the item <coughs> belongs to one person. You know what it feels like to me? Like when you're in university and in order to take this course on urban planning, you have to have this prerequisite, mm -hmm. which is modern French. And you, can, <laughs> you know, it, it, attunement is a is a too often a needless prerequisite. Well, it's you're, a way it becomes a barrier. To be uh. fair, Ed, you're speaking to someone who is actually a college scheduler. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know that. That's why I use that. That's why I use that thing. Um, and it's a firm instance, believer in the joys of modern French. Yes. <laughs> well, no, actually, years and years ago, when I was in high school. And they invented semestering and flung it at us. They said, here are your languages. You have to take this many credits in language. And the only way to get them was to take either Latin or Russian in one of your years, which was a course they never, ever offered. They canceled every year <laughs> because there were never enough people signing up for it. But it was the prerequisite in order to graduate. It was oh like, what? God. So attunement to me feels like too often. I mean, there are some items that, yes, would be attuned, but too often it's sort of like, ah, uh -huh, you can't use this item because you don't have the prerequisite. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you sell it or give it away or something like that? Because you can't use it. We've just nerfed it. Thank you. 
you know, good on you for killing the dragon to get this treasure. <laughs> mm. He's made a big paperweight out of that sword. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so, on the idea of wands, um, I fall somewhere in between the Harry Potter conception of wands and the D&D conception of wands in that I like wands that are representative of the wielder. Okay. But mm -hmm. evoke specific magic effects. So I don't like the idea of a wand as the one thing you need to cast all of your spells. Right. But, um, you know, the idea that uh, certain schools of magic, you know, require wand crafting as a way of focusing magical energies, of um, demonstrating facility with a particular spell. So you not only need to be able to cast it, but to infuse it in a magic item. Mm. that would allow someone else to cast it mm -hmm. um, uh, as a demonstration, not just of proficiency, but of mastery to advance as a teacher, for example, you know, you're now, um, you know, capable of, of instructing someone else in the art and taking on an apprentice rather than just kind of being a hedge wizard and, and going around and, you know, getting eaten by dragons because, you know, fourth level wizards are particularly yummy. Um, uh as to where um i'm not sure where i where i place it in the world you know what kind of magical school i i build this into um because one of the things that one of the one something that the realms doesn't have a lot of are these organized colleges of magical learning which I'm 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 against, by the way. I don't think the room should have them. Um, uh, a lot of magical teaching seems to be individualized or small group settings rather than, well, here's a university that rival wizards could very easily find and blow up, because um, that's what you'd get. Um, but I can imagine a particular lineage of wizards, or um, in, a, in football, it's called a coaching tree. You know, this one taught these these two, and then they branched out. And you know, so the several generations prior master wizard required um, you to be able to craft the wand of fireballs or whatever it may be before they would allow you to learn what's necessary to pass your magical knowledge onto apprentice wizards. Um, you know, one of the things that's lacking in modern. Uh, versions of D&D &D is the is the slow earned advancement of first and second edition things happen really 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 quickly um i have a table somewhere on my hard drive called orchiday um which basically says because you get x number of experience points for killing an orc if you killed an orc every single day how many days would it take you to get to 20th level um and every edition, it gets shorter and shorter. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea that you can, within a year, you know, <laughs> be more powerful than any other spellcaster or ranger or whatever else on the, on the planet um, feels a little unearned, at least for me. Um, but the idea that you'd have to perform real tasks not just right. kill monsters but real tasks to unlock learning and rights to gain knowledge that you could pass on is is for me um compelling real, real quick let's say let's say goodbye to steven he's got to work tomorrow he said oh oh poor thing steven sorry rest well buddy it's see good you. to see you How's the knee holding up? Oh, and he's gone. Oh, and that bad. Apparently, <laughs> apparently not well. <laughs> oh, there he goes. Okay, so Stephen had to go. So, anything else about your wand? That's all I got. That's all you got. Okay. I tried by the word. Do I? <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about ones as Brian was talking and I was thinking, and I think this has been done, but in a different medium, but I was thinking 
rather than having ones that are direct wand wands, I was thinking of something in, I suppose one descriptor would, for them would be augment wands. In other words, ones that attach or merge with other ones and give them give the one that it's merging with different effects. Like I was thinking in my head of a wand of dancing as a, a lot of sword of dancing. So you've got a wand of dancing. It doesn't do anything by itself, but when you link it to another wand, um, you can release it and the wand will, you know, once around fire off, you know, whatever attack it is that the wand can do. And maybe there's a cost in terms of it double charges or, you know, you can only do it once a day in fifth edition or, or something along those lines. Mm. And, you know, there's various options, you know, you could have one that does, you know, maximum damage or greater range or affects more than one creature or things like that. So just to riff off what we traditionally use and how we use ones and how we create ones as magic items and, and look and see if there's you know, uh, different ways that they can be used. So you don't use them just specifically for effects, but for like like stars or fireballs or ice storm or anything yeah, like that. You know, I okay. use them more for effects of of like the entire party or the situation you're in. Maybe well, it's... effectively, it's like merging meta magic into. I was going to say meta magic. Yeah. 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 So you know you could have something that you you can use once a day it becomes twice a day or something along those lines. Right. You know uh, stuff like that. There was something else that that got censored out by TSR back in the day. Um, I had wands that didn't have any offensive firepower, but they were enchanted by a ritual, which was a circle of practitioners um, working together, chanting and, and dancing in a circle. And they would do things like you plant the wand in the ground when you're making camp in the wilderness late at night. And it provides a way beyond line of sight warning system oh. so you you still have to have a sentinel you still have to stand watches but the sentinel knows that there is an intelligent creature over the size of a dog mm -hmm. in that direction that's all they know mm. and has is coming closer and is now moving that way Oh, there's a second creature, and the two of them have come together, and now they've moved apart, and they yeah. seem to be working together. So before he can see anything, or before you have the, the glowing eyes in the night, um, uh, he's aware that, okay, there's some sort of threat. So and before the monsters are hacking into you in Melly Eric Boyd style within four <laughs> seconds of the encounter. Again with the whining. They were CR appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just, I, just I, mail I, them a good cheese. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I was I was thinking as you were saying that, Ed, that actually it'd be kind of cool if in order to create the effect, you had to have two wands. Mm -hmm. And one of them had to be a good distance away from you. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like, uh, you know, a, two radars and you're kind of yep. locating based on how they both are. And well, the outer one sets the circumference. Maybe yeah. you've got to leave the yeah. other one of your party members has to be out with the second wand in order to make the whole thing work. So you've got the Chomp. guy he's got to sit out there by himself going, why was it my turn to stay alone? The Richard. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so are you thinking... Eric, like a like a mortar fire and a spotter, almost. Kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Jeez, I love spending nights up in trees in this deep forest with a wand up my rear end <laughs> and be this spotter guy because that's the only safe way I can spend it. <laughs> I, I was also thinking, like you know, when they build two astronom astronomy, uh, two like observatories on Earth really far apart to see from a different angle. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like one in the center of the universe and the other in Australia or something like that. And you can kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no. how's, how's, this, how's this still going? The, the James Bond one collapsed the other day. So, yes, yeah. it did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did. But, no, but yeah, no, but I also go. like what you're saying, Brian, about like, you know, a spot or whatever. But yeah, you could have two linked wands and you need them both going to kind of figure out where something is. Like... You know, I love to have invisible creatures to create that sense of terror. Like, um, the dragon's invisible, but you can feel the fear. 
And so the party is just sitting there. I'm probably doing a spoiler for next week, but uh, the party's like sitting there cowering. Um, like as the dragon fear washes Ooh. over them. <laughs> right. But you can't see it. So the only way you can find it is like, maybe you split up and you're like, where is the dragon fear stronger or weaker? In fact, actually that might be an interesting, um, you're all so item. doomed. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, be- th- that reminds me invisible stalker. Yeah. Oh, that's right. The the unpublished illustration for the Invisible Stalker that got dumped out of remember when monster compendiums were sheets of paper? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, three wing punch. Yeah, yeah. In the Bonda, yeah. Yeah. Well, when they published the Invisible Stalker, it was just an empty frame. Yeah. Yeah. But in the manuscript, the illustration for the Invisible Stalker had a cigar being smoked <laughs> in midair. <laughs> A la Nick Fury or Albert the Alligator from Pogo. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which someone at TSR censored out because we can't encourage smoking amongst children. Should have been a pipe. Should have been a pipe. They never would have said all invisible stalkers are Elminster. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> well, the stalker part is. <laughs> you guys can help me make one that I had started. You want to work on that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Got? Um. A campaign that we almost got more than two sessions out of Jeff the last time we were playing. Um, <laughs> See, it's not just doink, me. Doink. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we were gonna we were gonna change hands, and I was gonna run the campaign for a bit, and Jeff was gonna jump into a character. And let me he, guess, a dwarf. Yes, yes it with was. a Scottish <laughs> accent. Yes. Hey, yeah. Nadisla. <laughs> no, it wasn't this <laughs> Yeah, it was. It was Pistolar. Actually, it was Gadlin. <laughs> this one was Gadlin. This one was Gadlin, and um, the the party the party was going to be starting at a at a much higher level when I took it uh, to transition from what we were doing, and with Jeff's character um, as ostent- ostentatious as he usually plays characters, this was going to be a bit more visibly uh, effective. Yeah. I had created this particular magical pipe. And the pipe is in the shape of a long winding dragon to where the barrel of the pipe is the end of the dragon's head wide, uh, where you would place your various tobaccos. Um, I knew that one of the effects of the pipe would be uh, a spell type effect that I would call uh, dragon's breath at, to, at the point where Jeff's character could exhale out through the pipe and just make this big billowing blanket of smoke to be one of its effects. Um, it would have a, a sparkling effect while he smoked it. Um, but I never got into much of the more big deal parts of the uh, effects of the pipe that it could have other than those couple of aesthetic things. <coughs> so how big is the pipe? About this big. About like a, a good... A long Meerschaum pipe, probably. So before we dig into it, I just want to point out that there's one person on this call who wrote an entire article about a single pipe, (laughs) polyhedron 70. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I don't mean to hijack the conversation, but I thought that was important to point out. Oh, sure. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Curry, who crafted the pipe? This is of an elven creation. Um, and I never got into the background, so we can spend all the time that you guys like on it. But originally, it was gifted to his family. Um, the version of Gadolin that I was seeing in this story, in my mind, was long after um, the adventures that he had written about him in his book. And as a reward to the area that he lived in, one of the um, the the elven elven communities in the area the closest one being to wherever the the west galena mountains puts elves um basically rewarded him with uh one of these uh gifts for doing what he did and i'll, I'll leave the rest for everybody else to figure out if they read the story so i'll leave that alone but yeah yeah there's this pipe mm-hmm. okay so a couple things one is you probably want a number of um minor magical effects that depend on the kind of tobacco that's been loaded in 
Okay. Um, in particular, if there are rare leaves that grow in the area where the elves either were originally from or wished to go. Okay. Um, that might um, evoke certain um, story-based powers or visions that you wanna you wanna pull. Mm -hmm. um, there are laws against that. State laws. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the question then would be, are these programmed? Are these memories? Are these um, visions of the future, possible futures? So um, psychedelics. I like it. Um, and you probably also, since he's a dwarf, <laughs> uh, the <laughs> it, it, it's probably a serviceable hammer, too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, so it's not made of clay. It's not. It's durable. Right. It's durable steel. Yeah, it's a heavy pipe. <laughs> really. <laughs> you know, if you're making a dwarven pipe, I know that's not what you're making, but this is a thought that occurred to me as you were saying that, Brian. Um, you know, it's uh, moored in the soul forger, right? And sure. dwarves are... One way to think about dwarves is, you know, uh, at the at the forge. What if there's also, you know, intrinsic into how dwarves are created, there's a forge inside of them, in a sense, you know, a shard of the soul forger, mm. and the this pipe, what it actually does is it taps into that that fundamental nature, and so when you breathe the puff of smoke out, it's kind of like the furnace belching the fire and you get a power um that's probably around hitting something with a hammer of course um <laughs> while you're belching on this pipe and basically every puff of smoke that comes out is also sort of a manifestation of you doing something you know calling on the power of morden in some mm. way so you know you cast or, or you try to hit the guy with your hammer and you really need it to be a hammer, a flaming hammer. Um, you know, the pipe is puffing away uh, as a way that you're kind of using the internal dwarven magic to, to transform it temporarily into a flaming hammer or a frost hammer or whatever it might be. Mm. And the smoke matches the color. It's either red or it's white or whatever. Right. So you could do something along that line. Um, that's kind of off topic of where we're going. No, but... I, that's I, that's a good direction. The only reason why I even thought about going in the elven direction is because the way that I saw it in my mind it was it was so ornately crafted in the shape of a dragon. I just didn't think dwarven craftsmanship. I thought something that uh, an an elven creation would be more specific to design something that be that would be almost like lifelike in its detail does but, no um, one think of the gnomes yes no. but we we know eric the demon Boyd, worshippers so, so therefore we we leave them out no, or he'll no. he'll oh, kill okay. us all in this game they all smell like <laughs> fish yeah. um actually though that that's another way to go so i've been thinking about like dragon fear and dragon's breath as things that persist and don't go away after they're breathed. Um, so I had this idea of like, almost like an ooze-like embodiment of dragon fear that kind of creeps around and uh, wanders through the world. But you could also do like a persistent breath weapon, particularly if it's like the green dragon's uh, poisonous breath or the smoke that comes from the red dragon's fire breath. And so maybe you actually had a pipe that's like perfectly smooth, but like the dragon's breath, like the smoke from the dragon's breath mm -hmm. um, wraps around the pipe and forms arcane runes. And then you can almost call on the powers of what was in that dragon's breath uh, when you puff on the pipe. So it would be pertinent to the kind of the dragon effect that you were hoping to summon. Yeah. So like, so so like the way you craft the pipe is the pipe is placed uh, within the range of a red dragon breathing fire mm -hmm. and just on the uh, the periphery of where the red dragon's breathing fire and some of the smoke gets caught up on the pipe and wraps around it and forms sort of arcane runes on the blank pipe. Mm -hmm. And then thereafter, when you puff on the pipe, you can call on just a tiny bit of the dragon fire uh, and blow that out of the pipe or uh, something like that. You know, so it could create an effect like the uh, 
brazier of endless smoke, or it could be, you know, some sort of like agonizer scorcher effect. You know, you could come up with whatever you want. You mm -hmm. could do something the same with green dragon breath as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I like but, it. But, you know, I, I, like particularly with green dragon breath, I always had this idea of this persistent, never ending green dragon breath that sort of crawls across the moors like a rolling fog. But mm -hmm. actually, if you get caught in it, everything dies. Mm. Okay. Um, Desolation and... of smog. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, that is cool. Well, I know um, Ed has to wrap it up here. Um, so uh, do y'all guys want to keep going? It's been about three and a half hours, or we can keep going, and we can wrap the whole thing up now. My voice is pretty shot. <laughs> okay. No, that's good. No, I understand. We can wrap it up. I know George is uh, Sunday morning for him. So. It's only 2.30 in the afternoon. What's or wrong? there you go. <laughs> 2.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens when you're born inside the earth, like you. So, George, you got to write all these items up by tomorrow when we wake up. Yeah, one at a time. One at a time. There'll be our book report due tomorrow at the game. That's right. Bye -bye. <laughs> You are going to be there, right, George? I will be tomorrow, yes. Fantastic. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for showing. Brian, thanks for showing up. I know it was a short period, but we do appreciate your input. Oh, um, yeah, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to participate. Okay, well, we'll thanks for coming, out. guys. No, I'll yeah. keep you in mind for the next one. And I hope to do this again, because this was a lot of fun, i got to tell you. <laughs> so we were talking about magic items, right? That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in the dungeon. You're in the dungeon. Yeah. You know what? Forget everything we just said. It's a plus one dagger. <laughs> you yeah. That's right. It's, it, it's it. That's it. That's all you got to know. <laughs> so when you do the transcript from this, just hand it to Stephen. And he can start writing his DM skill thing. Oh, there you go. That's <laughs> and it will be called, so you're in the dungeon. <laughs> magic <laughs> items for the realms. That's, that's but perfect. wait, there's lore. There's lore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's, it's book one of, but yeah. wait, there's lore. That's there right. you go. <laughs> well, we'd, have to give, we'd have to give Eric Scott to be an executive producer credit. That's yeah, right. Definitely. That's right. That was, his, that was his idea. That was perfect. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming and showing up and doing this with us. This is a lot of fun. Thanks, um, everybody on Twitch that hung out with us and yeah. participated in the item creation tonight. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah really. Thank you, everybody, everybody that came in. We appreciate it. And we hope we'll do this again real soon. And um, maybe the same thing, or maybe we'll switch our ideas, what we want to do, not just magical items, but something different. We could do armor. We could do... Anything. Get spells, really. monsters, monsters, spells, spells. Monsters. Do monsters, monsters and spells. Right. I would love that. Right. So we'll do we'll do a uh, gnomish no monsters. So for Eric. <laughs> they're all monsters. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Okay. I'm right. a monster. <laughs> they're a monster. So that that section's done. <laughs> Don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> we'll just move their stat block right to the monster manual. We'll have to worry about it. So uh, we'll come up with another title, another uh, setting we'll, um, thing we'll do this in. And I appreciate it. Everybody have a great night. Thank you for showing up. Yeah, uh, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Great to spend time with you all, and great to see you, Brian. All right. It's, yes. That's right. That's right. I was remiss in inviting Brian. I'm glad he showed up tonight. So. Yeah, me too. That's terrific. Great to see you, Brian. But we'll get you in on the next one, Deal. Brian, for sure. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Good night, guys. Thank you. Good night, guys. See you next time. Hey, Curry. Good hang night. Out.